and it looks like we are recording. Hey, hello, welcome to today's painting lesson. Together, we are going to endeavor into a waterfall painting, but it's not just any waterfall. It's inset in this really unique rocky setting. And of course, as per usual, it will be in real time. In this tutorial, I will walk you through the steps to creating a dynamic moving water, give you some tips on how to make your painting's textures look extra realistic, and don't worry if you're fairly new to painting, I will explain it all in a clear, concise manner, while of course we do so in real time. That said, let me tell you about some exciting resources up over on the Patreon page, which will help make the drawing and painting process a lot easier. As a patron, you will get access to the traceables for these lessons, which will make it so you don't have to worry about getting your proportions or perspective right by yourself. Additionally, you can find my eBooks covering composition, color palettes, glazing, brushes, as well as just about everything you need to know about acrylic painting. Also, there are over a hundred bonus lessons up over on Patreon that you can't find here on YouTube. And you can also get personalized art critiques from me so you can get feedback on your work while continuing to improve your techniques. There are a lot of great resources up there. I do recommend checking it out. And with that, now we are going to jump into the lesson. It is a long one. It is a fulfilling one. And I think there are a lot of great little lessons within it. So let's relax, enjoy, and stay creative together. So we'll begin here today with a one inch flat headed brush and we'll dip the bottom third of it into a little bit of water then proceed to wipe off the excess. This will just help us keep the paint wet for a little bit longer. Now we'll start in the sky and it'll be a bright sky. So we'll begin with an abundance of titanium white, a little bit of cerulean blue. You can see I'm just using the corner of my brush and I use the other corner to grab some Mars black. The Mars black and the titanium white together will desaturate the blue to a point so we don't have anything that's just too visually notable in the beginning. We want our attention in the painting to be down in the rocks, the waterfall, and if we make the sky too vibrant, we can accidentally make it a little bit distracting. So I'm just going to begin by working our first layer through here I'm moving in an X-shaped pattern with my brush because it will help us move paint not only left and right, but up and down. And we will do two layers just to make sure that it's nice and thick. For those of you who may wonder why we always begin in the sky, it's essentially to make our jobs later a lot easier because we can essentially layer all of our foliage and rocks on top of it once it's dry rather than having to paint the sky around a lot of intricate foliage. So it's just a great way of prioritizing and it lets you warm up just moving the brush around, mixing paint before you get into the more complicated subjects, right? So once we get two good thick layers on here, we can let it dry and then start working on our foliage. So our paint is fully dry to the touch and I've just sketched in the foliage yet again using some Conte. Here on the palette we have two new colors. We have a thalo green which will be our primary green for the painting and we have yellow ochre which will be great for warming it, making it look like that nice bright light is working through the foliage. Now we won't need to brighten this for our foliage and we're working on our top middle area of foliage first. So we want it to be bright, but not too bright. We want to be able to build highlights into it, but also shadows on top of it. So we'll go for something. It's not too warm or too cool. Get a good amount of our paint built up. Maybe go slightly more desaturated. So we'll just add in a hint more of titanium white and Mars black. Whenever you feel like it is too desaturated, or too saturated rather, that's a very easy way of going about it. You can also add the complementary color, but we don't have any reds that we're currently working with. From there, I'm going to switch to a filbert brush, which is great because it has these rounded edges. And through little tapping marks, we can get the implication of individual leaves, of foliage. So I rotate my brush in the air and we end up getting 
all of these unique markings. We don't rotate it though on the canvas because if we do that, we end up getting a very inorganic application. So I just work my way along the edge of our foliage line here. Look for different pieces that can protrude and stick out. We can also create openings so we don't have to fill up all of these areas either, right? But then as we get towards the rocks to the left hand side here, we can be much more liberal with our application. As the foliage will be significantly more dense, there's a lot more of the physical tree in that area. So you don't end up seeing these open spots for the most part. We can have a couple, but we don't want too many. Now as we get farther to this edge, we can switch back to the one inch flat headed brush because it is a really nice sharp edge and it allows us to work around the rocks with real ease. So I'm just bringing this along all of our edges like so. And then with a little bit more pressure, we can expand our bristles and bring them out towards the edges of our foliage. Nice and easy. We can also use this to essentially work on these bottom portions and everything else first, right? With the exception of the edges. We have the paint, it's wet. And rather than letting it just dry on our palette while we work meticulously with the other brush, we can get some use out of it. So I'm not bringing it out too far. You can see that there's still quite some distance between it and our border. But now I'll make sure that brush is nice and damp. That way the paint doesn't dry. And we'll switch back to our Felbert. So, yet again, taps, different angles. If you hold your brush farther back, you'll get a bit more of an organic, natural stroke. It'll be a bit more difficult to control, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. As it'll incorporate an additional level of randomization, which you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. And when we paint, holding it like a pencil, sometimes we can accidentally fall into bad habits of creating unintended repetitions. And this just helps us avoid that. So in subjects where there is a lot of repetition, we're able to keep things looking a bit more interesting, a bit more natural. Continuously grabbing more paint if I feel like my brush is getting wet to the point where there's a granular aesthetic to the stroke, I'll also grab some water before grabbing new paint. Also, if you feel like you accidentally work too much of the greenery in, don't worry about that because we can always go back in and add sky, right? It's the wonderful thing about acrylics, we can just add layers on layers without building any unintended texture. And all of those layers are chances to make our last work better. That said, I'm going to make this a little bit brighter and warmer. So mixing in additional titanium white with our yellow ochre. And I'm going to place this towards the bottom. I'm also going to keep my taps at a bit tighter. This foliage is closer to us, so we get to see it significantly better. Where this is farther away, right? It's inset, and therefore, because of perspective, it's going to look smaller. So, 
the light is coming down, it's hitting it, it's making it brighter, but in addition to that, the stroke also has to change just a little bit. That said, here we are doing those rotated taps to the point where it's a bit of a blend down into this other green. We aren't too concerned about the brush strokes. I actually like a bit of the brush stroke showing. We're not looking for a clean blend here. We'll be doing a lot of layering on top of it, so if it looks messy, that's okay. And in fact, all of these little unique markings will help it build into something quite nice later on. So don't look at it as a, a negative. And with acrylics, again, another great thing is that because it's all so heavily built on layering, every portion of it doesn't have to look beautiful initially. Often, I feel like paintings really start to come together when you're 80, 90% done, and that's okay. So don't get discouraged. We will make it yours and mine look great. So from there, we'll mix up a slightly darker variant of our green. We don't want it to be too much, rather too saturated. So we're still going to work in a lot of titanium white and Mars black. And we do still want it to be somewhat warm. So we'll add in our yellow ochre, but this is colors for the shadows, so we don't want as much yellow ochre. The shadows will be a bit cooler, the highlights will be a bit warmer. So while we are incorporating it for cohesion's sake, we're certainly doing less. And there's more Mars black. So here you can see our three pigments. That's what we used for the majority. That's what we used for the beginning of the highlights. This is what we're using for the beginning of the shadows, but we're going to apply it with a new brush that is a fan brush. And as you can see, it has a lot of very stiff, fine bristles. Fantastic for adding an abundance of detail with relative ease. So here you can see I'm getting all of these markings already. So much smaller than we'd be able to get with any typical brush or application. I am rotating my brush like we did with the filbert because I want a randomized application. I'm not pressing too hard with the brush because I don't want the bristles to expand. And as that pigment leaves the brush, as it becomes more subtle, we move up into the brighter areas. But we typically start at the bottom and slowly expand upwards. So we begin here along the edge towards the bottom and the darker areas. And then as I run out, we'll get closer there. That said, I do need more pigment. So we'll mix yet again. I do a lot of remixing in these paintings. I just don't always show it because it is something that can get very repetitive. And once you know how to do it once, you should be doing fairly well, right? We can always just go back to that part of the video. It's also one of those things where I know these videos can be sometimes four hours long and it's likely best if they are four hours without the repeated mixing rather than six, six and a half hours with it, right? That said, if there's ever any difference in the mix, I do show that. But that is how we remix. I just keep a little bit of it on the edge so that I can color match later should we need to. And we just work that up nicely. Again, going back down to the bottom, starting farther away from the sky. And I'll get you a bit closer as we continue this process. Now, yet again, just grabbing a little bit of paint, holding my brush fairly far back, 
applying minimal amounts of pressure. Now I'm running out of pigment, so I'm working towards the edge. It's okay if we get it over here. Don't worry about that. Shouldn't be a concerning factor. We will paint over it and it will be dry by the time we get to it. There we go. I like to go over the darker areas multiple times. It builds up not only the layers of paint, but just the amount of surface area that's covered. And I like a lot of surface area to be covered with this in those darker spots, whereas when I'm in areas like this, I like it to be much more minute, significantly less so. You can see I'm just using the corner of the brush here to carefully craft in some of these portions. We don't have to press the entirety of the brush to the canvas, and often it's best if we just use the edges here and there. Now, as noted, multiple layers towards the bottom and darker spots. And you can almost get this gradient of texture as we move up, right? So once all of that's applied and dry, we're going to mix our brightest pigment yet. And it is going to be much warmer because it has a lot more light working through it. We'll begin with our yellow ochre, our titanium white. You can see that we're already interjecting some of our green simply by it being in the other two mixes. But we will grab some of it as well. We don't want it to be too saturated. So while we want it to be bright, we do need to have a hint of Mars Black. And we'll kind of bounce between the Mars Black and the Titanium White. Because this will inevitably make it darker than we want. But we are bringing saturation down as intended. This is a really nice color. I think if it was just a little bit more yellow, we have exactly what we need. So I'll put that down and then I'll grab my fan brush, which I will make damp. And when we make it damp, I'll show you what happens. Our bristles start to stick together. So rather than having hundreds, we might have 20 or we might have 10. And this is going to create a larger marking, but still a very small marking. Great for noting individual pieces of foliage that are really tiny, right? So I'll pick those up on my brush. You can see how many that is. And this is a stiff fan brush, but it's from the channel set and it was designed so that it would have the ability to render the very extremely tiny markings like a hard bristled fan brush should. But in addition to that, when it's made wet, they really cluster and clump like a soft bristled fan brush. So this one is fairly unique in that it can kind of act as both for you. I used to paint with two fan brushes. One was stiff for the really sharp portions and then one was softer for markings like this when I wanted them to condense, but I knew that even with a liner brush, I wouldn't be able to create markings this subtle. So essentially what we're doing is applying in light on foliage that's a bit higher, a bit farther away. We can work it into the rest of our greenery, especially towards the bottom. I'm not pressing with the entirety of the fan brush. I'm just using corners and edges. As you can see. And I'm going to create different levels 
of foliage. So I'll get you closer and we'll have a lot of fun with that. So we'll grab more of our pigment and you can see that I've started to create what is essentially a line of foliage right here and then it can kind of come up and then it dips back down and then it comes up. This means that we have foliage in front of this foliage so we're creating additional levels of depth and then with these because they're catching light they need little areas underneath them that protrude and also catch light so we just work a little bit below we continue in the most prominent areas while we have a prominent amount of paint on our brush and then as it starts to lessen as we start to run out we can work more so into the portions that have less light, greater shadows. We make our markings more sparse. We don't apply much pressure. We just show that there are hints, areas that do pop, but only a little bit. And we can also head back up here, work that into some of these, but as I get higher up, and I'll show you over here as well, I'm going to apply more pressure with my brush to get a slightly larger application because, again, perspective, we're going to see all of this foliage to a greater degree. It's closer to us, it looks bigger. Let's take you back just a little bit. So now we'll take the fan brush and it's starting to dry, so I'm going to dip the head of it in a little bit of water and wipe off the excess very similarly to how we did with the larger flat-headed brush in the beginning of the video. I showed a quick clip of how I do that, but same thing. And then I'll grab this pigment. We'll start working along the edge because that is where the majority of the light is able to wrap around and work through foliage, right? And then I'll slowly work my way back with it. Making larger impressions than I was before. Not using the entirety of the brush because I don't want to render full lines. And this is going to be a good transitionary application. It's not how we're going to finish the foliage. We want to switch to a different brush for that but we have the really minute markings and they start to build up so that when we incorporate a brush that makes definitively larger markings it feels natural All right? and I think we're just about there so as promised we are switching our brush over to a liner it's incredibly small, not as small as the individual bristles on the fan brush, which is why we started with that down here. But now that we do need them to be a little bit larger, this is fantastic. Now I'm going to make sure that it's nice and damp to condense the bristles. And then I'll grab some of our pigment, which we will begin to apply to the edges. And I do mean the edges. So, anywhere you see that darker green, that is to be surrounded with a stroke of this application, okay? We don't want that darker pigment showing beside the sky at any point because the light from the sky will work through. That darker portion of foliage and it will illuminate it, make it look brighter. So our job right here is to work somewhat meticulously and cover our edges. This is one of those things where I feel like often I apply it, I spend quite a bit of time, I take a step back, maybe have a coffee or a tea, and then I realize I missed an area, or five. So that might happen to you, <laughs> and that's okay. 
It's all part of the process. There we go. What we're also going to do is start working some of these applications and strokes inwards. So we did it randomly with our last brush. Here we do it intentionally. So we can start building form, clusters, in the same way we did down here, creating those levels. So here's an inner piece essentially. And I like to do this based off of which areas are still more green and brighter. Getting quite a few notifications. Sorry about that. I'm not sure if you can hear my phone. I have it out because I like to keep my reference photo on it so I can glance down here and there when I feel like I need just a, a detail check essentially. I don't like to adhere myself too deeply to the reference photos because I do like to take artistic liberties, but I think that they're fantastic to work with initially as they open your eyes to so many additional details that you wouldn't inherently think of. And that's often an issue a lot of people have, especially when they're beginning. People complain about their pieces looking a little too cartoony. It's often just because we don't, we're not as familiar with the subjects as we think we are. A lot of our ideas of what the subject looks like comes from when we were younger, we were watching cartoons, different things of that nature. And those were all simplified, right? So when we have to render a, a real version, something that is closer to realism, it can be tough. And an easy way of just finding what it actually looks like is to pay real attention to the reference photo. And as per usual, you can get the traceable, so the drawing of this, as well as the reference photo up over on Patreon with the ebooks, access to our exclusive Facebook group, bonus lessons, and all that good stuff. But as you can see, we just keep adding, building. And it works nicely. We do need another highlight. But before we do that, I do want to work on this side of the canvas. And here you can see that I'm working a lot more quickly. It's not because it's any different in terms of a subject, but rather we've just had practice, right? We're more comfortable, we're more confident with our application style, our pigment, our brush and things will just inherently speed up in the process. So we start with the edges. We find the edges of the open areas, which we can, again, reinstigate should you want more, with just the colors of the sky. I may do that later, but so far I'm very pleased. And then we can't just have it look like a drawing, like an outline. So we work those highlights of that foliage backwards. Here are some more green portions. So we'll work on those. My strokes are consistently changing in direction. But there are slight leading lines for the most part that point towards the center. I'm not making all of my strokes in that direction or it would start to look really awkward. But If a greater number of them point that direction than others, it will subconsciously lead the viewer's eye and act as a great little technique through that. Now there's a lot of darker foliage back here. And this is likely a little bit too bright to introduce in a large way into that space. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, using a small portion of this, make it a little bit more green, a little bit darker. There 
and we'll just adjust it so that it isn't as warm as we work our way back. And we're not just painting dots, we are painting smaller lines. We can also incorporate these on the other side, down here a little bit, make it cohesive, but these markings are very large for this spot, so you probably don't want to do much through there. And this is just for the protruding foliage, right? The areas that stick out, that aren't going to get a lot of shadow from everything else, and therefore can have some light working through and around them. All of our markings are purposeful, and we're just building this landscape literally in front of us, all right? There we go. I think it's starting to actually look quite nice, but it can look better and we're about to make it so. With that, we're going to mix the brightest version of our green yet. I'm going to mix it right beside this one. That way I have a reference point. It's also going to be the warmest. So you can see a lot more of our yellow ochre than you can our thalo green in here. I'm not used to working with thalo green, but I think it might be a new favorite. That said, this is certainly brighter than anything else. We'll put down the one inch flat and we'll pack back up the liner. Now from here, Yet again, the idea is to work around the edges. You can work it inside, but I'm going to work this much more sporadically around our edges than I was before. I want little pieces to stick out and protrude. I want it to feel like we can't quite see the smallest branches, but we can see the clusters of foliage that are on them. So here, it isn't really connected to everything else. We don't have that tissue there to justify it visually, but we know by looking at photos and really being out in nature, observing it, that there are so many situations where you can see the clusters of foliage and it looks like they're just existing within the air, which is really neat. Also, this is really the only time where I'm working in the bottom with the liner brush. Trying to make incredibly small markings and you can do that by keeping your brush damp so the bristle is condensed, but also applying as little pressure as possible. The more pressure, pressure you add, the larger the application gets. So we're just trying to keep it really tiny. Might add hints of it into the areas that are separating, but I don't want too, too much. This really is a subtle addition down there and a more prominent one up towards the left and right hand side. This is going to give us some extra depth make the day itself feel a bit brighter. Let's get you closer. Yet again, this will be nice and easy. Working around those edges, finding my way out. I am now holding my brush farther back intentionally because I felt like some of this felt a little bit robotic and I want that randomization factor. I don't want to subconsciously lean into, oh, I've been painting this way for a minute and a half, I'll just continue painting exactly the same way and end up with a piece that is a little too visually monotonous. So here, 
we make our job of rendering intentional markings a little bit harder. And that brings genuine life to the painting. I'll also take just hints of it, work it into the openings, into some of the areas that protrude and we just want extra depth in them. When we paint it here, by the way, it will be darker than when we paint it in the middle, because in the middle, we see that lighter blue sky underneath it, where when we paint it here, we have the darker pigments. And because we're using water, because it's acrylic, it's semi-transparent, and those colors impact this layer and the colors, the values of this layer. So the markings that I apply in here aren't actually as bright as they are on the real outskirts. So without changing our pigment, we can actually just get a little bit of extra diversity, which is great. Really love painting foliage like this. I did a little poll up on our Patreon Facebook group asking what paintings everybody wanted to see next. One of them was the lightning piece from the previous upload. This was another, there was a beach scene. But this one won by a dramatic amount and I decided not to do it first despite it winning because I wanted to do it on a much larger canvas like we are here today. And you can always find the size of the canvas in the video description by the way. But with that, I just wanted to give it a lot more attention, a lot more detail. We can do that on the larger canvas. It means it will take longer, but it seemed like everybody liked the idea of this one a lot in that poll. So I figured we'd give it the extra attention it seemed to deserve. I also just love scenes like this. Growing up, I was around these interesting caves and foliage. We'd go up to Algonquin Park in the summer, or these fun waterfalls. So it's a, it's a nostalgic setting for me personally. So stepping back, I'm actually really happy with it. And I think we can leave the foliage as is for now. We can always go back and augment later. But as you may be able to see, I just have drawn in a couple of different branches using, yet again, Conte. I've just used orange because I want it to be a bit of a warmer uh, branch color. That said, here on my palette, we now have burnt sienna and we have burnt umber. Now I'm going to take about an equal mixture of these two so that it's nice and earthy, but it's also not too saturated or too red. We'll grab some titanium white, about a third of that in Mars black, and we'll make a nice darker gray mixture for our first application. And this is very much the middle ground, could be the highlight in some scenarios. And then we switch to the liner brush to actually apply it. So. Grab that pigment, and when we apply this, we want to essentially work it in between a lot of our foliage with some branches and others it's going to just be on top of the foliage. When we get towards our edges, the strokes get larger, so I apply more strokes and I apply more pressure, and as I get closer out here, I make them smaller. So here yet again, more pressure, more pressure. I'll also go back here, load up those highlights a little bit. We'll jump to the other side. And we'll just go back and forth, slowly adding branches to both sides. Though, again, if you are working with the traceable, you can just copy that. You can also add some of your own if you just feel it's going to be beneficial to your piece because our foliage is going to look a little bit different. And these lessons 
are meant to help you, meant to aid you, meant to guide you, but they're not meant to handcuff you. I always want them to offer ideas and allow them to help you in future works, right? Bring the ideas over. But I don't want to always just say, do exactly this. Because I think with art, so much of it is that intuitive, great, subjective interjection. And I want you to be able to feel that you have that. So I'm just going back. I'll get you closer and we'll work on the details together. Now the greenery is very full of depth. This right now, incredibly flat. We're about to change that by adding some Mars black into our mixture, just making it a bit darker. We do the mix with the larger flathead because we can just move paint around a lot more effectively. And then we'll switch back to the liner. Now the areas that are closer to the edges are going to be darker as a whole. But in addition to that, the edges that are opposite to where the light is are going to be darker. So here we're getting a lot of light through there. It'll get both the top and the bottom of this branch. So I'm actually working the shadow in between to show that the light is essentially coming in front. We're looking behind. But the base of it here, for the most part, is just darker. It'll look quite stark here initially in relation to the foliage and all of that. That's okay. Here we can even move out little branches that weren't previously initiated. Just work those through get those extra details building up and they'll get randomly lost as well. A lot of these much darker, smaller branches should be done towards the back and the inner portion of this foliage. We'll use a brighter hue brighter value for when we get near the edge. We will also hop over onto this side and I'll change the camera angle before we do that. But here you can see I'm just bouncing. In here I'm trying to dodge a lot of the brighter pieces. Let's head over to the other side though. So it'll be a similar process, though this time the light's going this way. So we'll apply it to the back. And that's on the right hand side of this tree. Because this tree is much more vertical than horizontal. We're not running the shadows through the middle to the same degree. Though we will still have smaller branches just working their way through the forest. We can also start moving it down. As we do, we want these to be really small. So as little pressure as possible. We want to avoid all the highlights. And see just how tiny those are. That's what we want to achieve. Or maybe you can't see. And if you can't, that speaks to how small they are. And that is still what you want to achieve. Now 
Okay, now let's grab some titanium white, work that into the mix, maybe grab a little bit of our yellow ochre, mix that in. And this can be a nice highlighted pigment for the areas that are catching light. As I work my way around the branch, I'm not just making a singular elongated marking. I like to do lots of little taps. That gives it some texture, makes it look more natural. You have the implication of bark through that application. I don't want to do much of it down here just because these are so far away, you're not really going to see much of that, but we can add a hint of it when we have almost run out of paint and it's just a watery mixture left on the brush. So I do want to do this next part with a bit of a distance because I'm going to be jumping around in the canvas a lot and I want you to see just how subtle it is. Often when we're really close, hyper-focusing on the details, we don't realize just how minute or insignificant an application is and how subtle it needs to be. But when you paint from much farther away, it becomes much more evident. So I'm really not doing much here, but I am placing additional branches in between. Predominantly closer to us, so up higher. We really don't want much of it down here, though we can do the occasional marking which you likely can't see that far away. This is just for the people who are extremely invested, they get up and close with the canvas. And I think I'm going to actually do another more vertical branch through there. And then these branches don't just exist in front of all of our foliage, right? So we'll remix some of the mid to darker hues that we had for our green. We can also do the highlighted ones as well, but I want to start with the mid to darker. And we can place those on top. doing it sporadically. That way it just gets lost and it pops out and then it gets lost and then it pops out. It will make it feel like it's really there instead of just being imposed on top. Now we'll go for the brighter. Much more of that yellow oh I love that definitely needed because these branches are going to protrude and they are going to have leaves and because they are protruding leaves they will have highlight All right so it's just setting them back in the painting in a way that they should be We can add more branches if we want, but I think, I think I like that for now. Now, the next step is a big one, and that is blocking in this larger rock surface. It's just the base layer, but we're going to vary different shadows and highlights within it. We'll do so with the larger flathead brush because we have a lot of surface area to cover. And we're going to work with pre-existing pigments on our palette. Now, I'm going to begin by rendering the brighter pigment for it. And that'll start with some of our yellow, equal amount of our burnt umber. Titanium white, I'll start with about an equal amount as what I used in the other mixtures, giving us a nice 
brighter hue for where the sun hits. And of course we need to desaturate it just a little bit, so we'll interject some Mars Black, which will bring it down just a hint. Now we'll mix up the darker pigment to go right beside it, and we'll do that right over here. It will have the same pigments with the exception of a lot more Mars Black. So where we used about the same amount of titanium white in this mixture as everything else, we're using the same amount of Mars Black as everything else over here. And we still will use a little bit of titanium white to desaturate it. So from there, I'm going to use this brush and I'll just start mapping in where my shadows are going to be within this. And you can see that there's a lot of movements going down here. These are a lot of leading lines. They're pushing our eye towards the center of the painting. There will be a lot of refining later on in this process. So right now we're just trying to get the idea of it. And I'm painting relatively quickly because I want to get a slight blend with our highlighted pigment as well. Now, everything we're painting right here is a shadow, right? So it's an under portion that isn't getting light. There we go. Doesn't have to be perfect. Does not have to be perfect. And then as we get down here, it transitions into more of a vertical stroke. The strokes get wider. And then where it goes down like that, it starts to change and work this way. Now we're not going to do all of that right now because we need to work with this while it's still wet. But we'll start getting the line work in there, okay? Now, make my brush damp again, grab our highlight, and head back up to the top. This pigment will be diluted by that darker pigment that we just had on our brush. Won't be exactly the same as what we have on the palette, that's fine. It'll actually make it more eclectic and interesting. So we'll work this all the way inside and you can see that there are varying hues within it. As I work the edge of this darker pigment, we have a transitionary area, which is great. It looks like it goes sideways and then down and under. And I'm just letting the pigment work naturally. I'm not trying to force any particular look within it because all of those unique brush strokes will be fantastic for building depth with our details. There we go. It looks a little messy right now, but that's okay. It's how it's meant to be. And you can see this transition as it gets darker and darker. It isn't just a hard line. There's a little bit of a blend. There we are. I'm trying to hold my hand in a way that which you can see well. It's a little awkward. You might not want to hold your brush in the exact same way I am there. That's more for you than it is for me. We're just mixing more of that paint, leaving a little bit of it on the edge so that I can see that I'm mixing the same pigment. We are almost there, just needs a little bit of a darker hue, and that should do it. So jumping back in, this pigment will be a bit more clean as we have more pigment of this on our brush now than we do of the mixed darker hue, that's okay. Especially for an area that's receiving significantly more light, we can even use it to start building up highlighted layers up here. 
And now we'll start working this down. So getting back to it, you can see that my brush is predominantly working in the same angle in which the creases in the rock are, all little fissures and divots. I really want there to be a transition towards the bottom. And at this point, a lot of the shadows are starting to dry. You can see that I'm not getting that same blend that I was previously. But I'll show you how we can re-interject that in just a second. For now, I'm just going to get all of my highlight layer just kind of worked in. Try to establish no white canvas still showing. There we go. Now, we'll go back to that darker hue. And we'll re-interject that. So we're just going back and forth between our two pigments. Ideally is they're wet, but that won't always happen and that's okay. We're just keeping it nice and linear. I'm also going to take some of this hue this more muddy hue and interject it up here just to show there are divots within the rock and I'm choosing right here because it's an inset area, right? It's more towards the rock than it is outwards where this protrudes and this protrudes. So this naturally will be a bit darker because it's more inset, it'll get more of a shadow from that where things that are sticking out don't get shadow from the tops of it. And again, brush strokes are your friend here. You don't have to overwork any of it. In fact, I think it'll look a whole lot better in the end if you don't. Here I'll go for a bit of a softer blend. There are still elements of white canvas that I'm slowly attempting to work my way through. That said, we're going to do a lot more to this rock to make it look great. So if yours is looking a little messy right now, don't get discouraged. There will be refining with a different brush, maybe a couple. And we want to make sure that all of this has a couple of layers. I've been painting with a lot of paint, so it's fairly thick naturally. But you can definitely see spots down here, predominantly in the brighter areas, the brighter hues, where the canvas is showing through. We have quite a bit of titanium white in our mixture, and titanium white inherently will make it so you don't need as many layers just because it's such a thick pigment. But we also have the yellow ochre, which isn't that thick. Also taking some liberties from the reference photo. If you watch the channel regularly, you know that that's a fairly common thing for me. Here I'm trying to make it a bit more diverse. So rather than having all of those lines look so similar, we're essentially taking out that larger middle portion here. I'm doing a bit of a tap. It's not always a drag. Now, before we work on all of the refinement there, we're actually going to continue the general base layer throughout the bottom. And this part gets interesting because unlike this, it's very much inset. It's underneath the rest of this rock, so it's not going to be receiving any direct light. But, where it gets neat, it's going to be receiving reflective light from the water 
that we have down here. So it's going to still have a brighter hue to it, just not as bright as what we have up there. So we have our typical darker pigment, we have our typical lighter pigment. With a lighter pigment, I'm going to interject some of my burnt sienna. So we make it a bit more of a red. And then I'm going to darken it as well. So now we have a nice new hue, similar to the previous because it still has the yellow ochre worked in. And this is going to be for the areas that protrude down here outwards. So the areas that'll catch light from this, while there will still be inset areas that protrude even more that don't get that light. Now this is one of those areas that's going to be a little awkward for me to paint and show you, but I'll do my best. Connecting it to some of the highlights that we have that kind of turn down into here. I think I could actually use a bit more red, if anything. And we want to do multiple layers, so it's not a bad thing at all. There we go. Nice and messy, just as we like to begin. Then I'll grab the darker pigment, also interject a little bit of that burnt sienna into it. So it's nice and cohesive. And then we start that blending process up into the previous. And I do that through taps and drags because this darker pigment is different from what we had up here. We need it to transition it naturally, which softer blends and little taps throughout. But then we can come back down to the bottom, start filling in the negative space which is empty and open canvas, right? Now at this point, this actually looks just as bright, or close to it rather, as the top. We will darken it through additional layers. But it's a lot easier to darken pigment than it is to brighten it. So if you're going to falter on the initial layer in one direction or the other, typically making it brighter is better than darker. We have some rocks right here. I'll just sketch around them. And this is interesting because it starts to move out like this and into the next body of rock. Visual body, they are connected. Now we'll make it darker, extra Mars black. Still need that titanium white. Double down on the red in it. And you can see that this is a darker hue than what we have up here. Darker value. Trying to keep my hand and all of that out of the way for you. There we go. Grab some highlight. Again, a little bit too bright, and I want to open it up. So I'm working more in this direction, but with the full head of the brush instead. So we're slowly darkening by working over our highlights, with a bit of a soft blend. Yet again, I think I want it to be brighter. And we're just going back and forth until we find a combination that makes us happy, right? And 
And then as we get down here, we need to move those angles, those brush strokes, so that they find themselves working into this next section and series. Like so. Start with something brighter that we can dilute. This is something that will take layers, it is something that will take practice, and that is not a bad thing. It'll make you a lot better of an artist to go back and do it two or three times. You'll learn something every time. Different portions might be a little frustrating. But don't be afraid to mess up what you've done because the lesson from messing up will likely be more valuable to you long term than having a perfect painting. Because you can take a lesson whether it be about technique or color mixing or layering and interject that into every future piece you have, right? So we're not afraid of failure. And if you don't try, well, that's when you really fail, right? So stick with it. Keep painting. You've got it. If you really, if you really try, you can find some magic and make something special, right? Don't give up when it gets a little hard. Now I'm working in tinier little markings. Connecting these, now that my pigment's diluted to the point where it's very similar to what we have at the top. Like that. And you have that beautiful little wrap around. Again, we haven't started interjecting the actual details into this. That will come later with a different brush, but I think just through general workshopping and going back and forth, we have a good base. Now, this next area is definitely the most complicated visually of everything because it has a lot more of those little movements than everything else, and it's much more tight in those movements. We also have this area, which I'll just block off for you now, which is going to be very much indented in the rock, so this will carry a lot more shadow then everything else here. We'll also have a bit of extra shadow up here because this will protrude and create a shelf effect. I'll also have some greater shadow right here. And I know it looks like I'm just putting <laughs> really messy paint on the canvas. It's more so to remind me of where things are and teach me than it is to end up with a good painting, right? We're going to cover all of that with layers that will make it a good painting. This is just about making sure that we can proceed with some level of planning. So those are essentially my darker spots. That said, we are going to have a lot more light hitting this. It isn't the underside like it is here. It's more of the larger, bold, towards us viewpoint. So with this, we do need to re-render the pigment that we have right here. It was the pigment that we made for our first highlight. We'll need quite a bit of it. I always like to leave a little bit of every color if I can on my palette. Eventually, it's not doable, but we try our best for as long as we can. And it makes finding those older pigments a lot easier, like what we're doing right here. 
That said, it is a little bit more inset, and depending upon how you want to work your light, you could make this brighter than what we have up here, or darker than what we have up there. But I like the idea of making it slightly darker, because then the light from the waterfall will stand out more. We can create more of a contrast. So this is my initial color. This, I want to be very similar, but I'm going to purposefully make it a little bit darker. Not a lot, but a little bit. We have a good amount of paint there. Now we need our shadow pigment, which isn't going to be as red, but it will have some red in it. So we'll use both our burnt umber and sienna, our Mars black, titanium white, and this one's quite easy to mix up, right? At least in relation to what we had over here. I'm just slowly throwing more hue into it until I feel like it's just a little bit earthy. There we go. Now with this, you would have to worry about making sure this edge is safe and refined, but we're going to go back and add our details after anyway. Also, I can tell this is a heavier contrast than what I have here. So I can either add more contrast to this or I can make this a little bit brighter. And I think I'm going to opt for the brightening. Give that a test, much better. Okay, so for this, I'm going to have this area that comes down. It's kind of a, a continuation, it's inset. And then I'm going to follow a lot of the lines that I've drawn in. These are on the traceable, uh, I'll put up on Patreon, so you can just copy that if you're up there. If not, you can see that it swerves in, down, out, creates those inset pieces and that depth. And then in here, we have a bit of a sharper turn, but it's that same idea. Up towards the top, We need a bit more water on the brush. Creating smaller lines, but they're following that general movement pattern. And don't be afraid to work that towards this edge in fear of messing up this part, because again, we are fixing that a little bit later on. I'm going to interject a bit more of this darker pigment into these middle areas that are more inset. So you can see it's brighter here, it's brighter here, and in that dip, it's darker. So now we'll grab some highlight. And I know already that I'm going to go back and do this probably five times, as we find our ideal shapes. I'm going to work down here first, I think, just because this pigment is starting to dry, the darker hue, and I want to be able to make my pigment a little bit muddy, a little bit more eclectic before that happens. Strange, I know, when you want your pigment to be muddy, but it is just one of those things where we are working with rock and it really helps build on the intricacy of it. There we are. Then we can work it back into these motions and patterns, right? Now it's cohesive through there. It's very simple in relation to the reference photo. That's okay for now. It's just our base layer. Adding some extra darker hues to that center portion. I might even grab this with a hint of the darker hue make a, an in-between pigment 
for areas that I don't want to be too, too bright, but I still want to be in the highlighted category. Just like that. And of course we bring this all the way up to the top. You can see that I'm messing up that edge. I'm doing so knowingly. And I am a-okay with it. Don't be afraid of failure. Now, we're going to re-interject some of those highlights so it's not the diluted darker mix. Instead, it's just the highlight. You can see that as we apply it, we really build on the body. We add a lot of depth to these markings. And we can do that all the way throughout. these motions. My brush was getting a little too dry, so I just dipped it in water, wiped off the excess. That way we can get a sharper marking again. So it dips in, it dips out. There's a second highlight here before it dips in again. I'm just using the corner of my brush right now. We're just painting with a light right now. Right now, right now, right now. That's a term that is apparently stuck in my head. My apologies. There we go. Now, to me, comparatively, it's looking a little flat, right? We are going to deal with that, but before we do, I am just going to paint in this section of shadow. And that means using the darker hue that we are currently working with on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, doing a soft blend up into this area and through here. Some of it you can have a soft blend because it can be a, a greater transition from light to dark because it isn't a hard line where there might be a hard line through here which creates the much sharper aesthetic and having both of them makes it a much more unique piece. So now we'll go for a middle of the road hue mixing both of them and I'll work that into the center. Maybe a little bit more towards the left. There we go. Definitely feels like we have a dip, but we do need to refine. And we're going to do so with a different brush. And that is our smaller flathead. This is great for details. It can still pick up quite a bit of paint. It has a nice sharp tip when wet. So I'm going to make it so. You can see that it really condensed the bristles. And then we'll grab our highlight yet again. And now we can do some detail work. And this isn't real detail work. It's just getting us the detail work that we already had up there. But because this is a smaller, tighter area, we need a better brush to achieve that. Or not a better brush, but rather a, a brush more suited 
for working in tight spaces. And here you can see that I'm creating that additional contrast, making that dip inwards. And it's starting to garner the aesthetic of that which we have up a bit higher. Then I might work it into here a little bit. Just give us that little transition inside, soften some of those edges that were quite bold initially. I'm quite content with the top being a bit brighter. So I'm not going in with that same muddy hue. And it isn't always just lines, sometimes they converge. I think I actually want to create an additional shape right there. Looking at the reference photo, I see it, I like it. It's diversity in a good way. go. See, now we have some separation. And we can make this a bit of a deeper shelf. Make it a bit darker, just towards the real edge. And that's really what this area needs more of, that heavier contrast through the darts that we established up here. So that's what I'm going to start doing, especially in this middle section. And I'll get you a bit closer as we are working with the smaller brush. So, Going back to this middle portion, you can see that I'm using the sharper edge of the brush, not the larger head, even for larger areas. And I'm just softly working. As I run out of paint, you get this more watery mix. So it's just darker and it can act as this almost granular little layer that adds texture. Now it's getting much more dramatic in the same way that that is. So it goes in, and it comes back out. You can see that we have these protruding pieces of wall We're just refining. But I really can't wait until we get into the detail work with the other brush, because that's when this all starts to look like we have some magic. And we will get there. We just need some patience. Let me, let me prove it to you.
Lots of attention to detail, right? Softening a couple of the edges. My paint is starting to dry on the palette. Always get asked the question, how do I avoid that? Simple answer is I do not. <laughs> it happens to all of us. It's okay. Just remix our paints. You can mist your palette. There are different techniques you can do to keep it wet. I don't personally like to do that though because I like to work with water. And I find when my paints already have water in them from misting and other sources like that, it makes my ability to intuitively add water much more difficult. So it's not something I really like to play with. That said, I'm going to redefine this edge just so I have a better idea of what I'm doing. There we go. And we're definitely getting closer to moving on to the next step. Here I'm jumping around a lot, just trying to achieve something harmonious. Lots of little taps. Looking for the areas that are much more inset to make darker. Now, as we step back, we can see that there are a lot of details, a lot of movement, a lot of rhythm through here, and that's great. But it's really important that we balance it so that it doesn't become overwhelming. With that in mind, we're going to start creating different shapes and larger shapes. That's going to begin right down here as our base. It's going to use similar hues, but we will start with mixing more of our darker pigment, Mars Black, Burnt Umber, equal mixture of our Burnt Sienna, a little bit of Titanium White, and a little bit of our Yellow Ochre. Though it is important that we have a bit more of the Burnt Sienna than it is the Burnt Umber or Yellow Ochre. And we're getting closer to us, which typically means we can increase the contrast a little bit, make the darks a little bit darker, and with that, you know what, before we actually apply it, I'm going to mix the lighter pigment as well. And my brush is very muddy, so we already have every color we were just working with in this new mix. I'm going to make it a little bit more red than gold. Just like that. Now here, we can actually begin with it. We're going for less detail than we previous had, previously had. We are also making this a larger block of a rock. There we go. It's not going to have a real abundance of light, but the top will get the light. And then we'll have just Little bits of areas that get light from the reflective water through here. With that, we can switch over to our darker mixture. I'm going to work it around that area that had the reflective light and just softly blend that. Though I am keeping some brush strokes in there. Then we'll work this through here, get those nice little softer blends, which will happen naturally. But you can see that as a subject, 
This definitely stands out from everything else that we did up there. That's very intentional. Now we will be painting water towards the bottom of it. So the bottom doesn't have to be perfect. I do want to make this darker as you move towards the bottom though. This area has the least amount of light. And the value should reflect that. There. After we did everything else, this should be a bit easier, right? Had a lot of practice. Just working some tiny sharp lines in. There we go. Here I'm just doing enough layering so that I make sure it's all nice and thick. And I might grab some of that extra highlight because everything else was made muddy. This is brighter by the way than what we have back here. So it should stand out to a point in relation. Next, we're blocking in this little nook right here, which I recognize from a drawing perspective, very confusing. Everything with the cross hatching, so the line work that goes back and forth, is an area that has a lot of shadow. So I know that those are the darker areas. We also have the little separation pieces, all the little fissures. Those are just the darker pieces that move inwards. This has significantly less of a pattern visually than what this does, which, might seem intimidating, but it's actually a really good thing for the piece as a whole, as it'll keep it much more unique and natural. So with that, we do need our brighter pigment for it. And as you can see, I kept that original bright pigment on the palette, just a hint of it, but I do want it to be a little bit darker. So we will aim for that. We can always brighten later through highlight and we will definitely be doing so. So there's our mix, a bit more yellow heavy. We'll need our darker mix, which as you know, will be more red heavy with the burnt sienna. And we just go back and forth till we have what we really want. That said, as you can see my brush, covered in paint. I'm going to take that off on a little painting cloth, make my brush damp. That way we get that nice sharp edge and I have much more control of my brush than what I would have had I had to work with all of that additional pigment. Now here I am going to begin by blocking in the darker areas. just because I do want this to dilute everything else. And that means essentially working in all of the defined lines that I have already mapped out here. Going back, doing second layers, making sure it's a bit thicker. That'll also keep it wet longer, right? Simply because there's a larger amount of paint. My brush being damp is also helping us keep it wet.
I like to do the edging first. And then when I start to run out of pigment on my brush, that's when I work in to the body of the negative space. Just like so. Make this area a bit darker, but we'll have it blend. So I'm not looking for a hard edge. And I'm making this area darker specifically so that the waterfall itself stands out to a greater degree. It isn't like this in the reference photo. This is an artistic liberty to make the waterfall just a little bit more visually dramatic. And again, I'm not too worried about these edges because I am going to go back to them later on in the painting process with real details. So, I think we have enough pigment on there. We'll grab our highlight. This is the most prominent open area. It'll be the most visually explored by the audience. So I'm going to start here. You could also warm up and practice elsewhere, but I feel like we've been painting for quite some time and we're all probably feeling fairly warmed up anyway. That is a good general rule though. If you are still warming up, start in an area that won't be as looked at, recognized, just won't have that much attention. But if you are warmed up, then you can start in the areas that really matter and prioritize them. That is when you're not layering very specifically for the ease of depth. And all of this that I'm putting towards the center is going to start blending through brush strokes into this. See that? We're just defining that area. And we can have little protruding pieces that catch extra light towards the bottom. I love painting rocks. I'm having a lot of fun. Rocks and mountains. I actually really want to do significantly more mountain paintings on the channel, but I know that that's an unpopular opinion. Simply through the metrics of which videos do well. And it's a little unfortunate, but I think sometimes we just need to do pieces for ourselves. This has a lot of rock. So it's, it's similar. It scratches that itch, right? You can start to see that there's shape and dimension being formed. This area does need to be darker as a whole as it drapes down. Don't be afraid to make some edges sharper while others are softer. There we go. I skipped breakfast as I had this real inclination to just get at the canvas. I think it's almost time. So I might take a little break soon. You will not 
see or experience said break because of how these are edited, but I bring it up specifically just as a friendly reminder to you that it's very easy to get lost in the painting process. It happens to me all the time. Forget to eat, forget to drink, and that's not healthy. So if you haven't had any water throughout this process, friendly reminder to do so. And I note that not only for your general health, which is important and number one, but also because often when we don't eat or drink, our hands get really shaky and that makes painting really hard. So it's also just for the general benefit of your work. That's at least how I justify all of my extra stacks while dieting. Have to eat for the art. Recognize I'm not describing my brush strokes to the same extent that I typically do, but that's because so much of this is intuitive. And it's the lights coming down, which areas are upwards and facing the light, which areas are inset and darker, where are the crevices? Right, it's just following those same rules, asking yourself that question through every piece of it, and then balancing your values of what should be brighter and what should be darker. Still messy, but we're getting there. So taking quite a few steps back, an important part of the process here, just so we can see what it looks like as a whole, I want you to notice just how different the shapes are in this, the line work, the blocking, than what we have right here. Here, it's a lot of these moving lines. They're elongated, they work through shadow, they work through highlight. They get a little bit brighter as we move up in the painting. They get a little bit darker, especially the darks as we move down, right? But it's always this line work. Over here, we have more large structure. So essentially, to simplify it before you start working on it, we have a block of light here. This is a protruding rock. It has its details inside, but this is one solid protruding piece. Here, we have that same thing. It's a bit more of a triangle in shape, but it sticks out, it catches that light. And these are the only two subjects along this wall that stick out. This one sticks out more than this one, and we can see that right through here, that it's in front, so we create additional depth through that as well. And if you can just make that triangle, this rectangle that's slightly slanted, it's a leading line, right? A lot of it's pointing inwards, that's intentional. Then you can essentially build this very simply. So it's a complex visual of a drawing, it has a lot of complex little unique pieces to it, but when you simplify it down into simple shapes, which we should be doing, it's much more manageable. And then it's just about creating little details in the highlights and then adding little highlights amongst the negative space that coincide and work with this area. So take those steps back, make sure that you just have your slanted rectangle, your triangle, and then just a couple little highlights throughout to make sure that they don't look too unique to the space in which they are in. That said, 
We're going to start moving down to this area now. So I will get you a bit closer. And this one is quite simple. It's much akin to what we have there, which is nice as it creates a balance between both sides where we have variance up here. So heading down here, we'll begin the same way that we did this one, just for some consistency's sake. And that's beginning with a highlight, which can go all the way across here. It's like a tortoise shell. Then we have this little, again, like rectangle above it. And the highlights that we are currently placing are going to dissipate as you move down and towards the edges. Also a little bit towards the back because this is a darker shelf which will cast a shadow. So we'll grab our highlights and I'm going to start down here just because it's the most visually familiar thing to work with. And we're doing that by cutting the shadow into the highlight in the same way we did the other sides. Just like so. Then we have a little bit of a blend. And we're also going to have an area that goes in like this, right here. And I'm bringing those shadows up as they dissipate because they'll be a lot softer. Where we want the bottom to be darker. And we can just start filling in the empty canvas. with what is now a very diluted pigment of the two. Because we've mixed a lot of it. There we go. So, always fun to see a very unfinished rendition versus a somewhat finished rendition. Again, that doesn't have the details yet, but there certainly is a dramatic variance between what we're working on and what we've done. So now, going in with a darker pigment, or really the same pigment that we used before, but not diluting it to the same extent, we can start to build those greater contrasts, all of those unique features within the rock, making this look a little messy, a little muddy. Go back to the highlight, and I think I want something a bit brighter for the highlight here. Might even incorporate a little bit of that red. But I essentially want something brighter because this is so muddy and dark right now that we need something brighter just for the blend. Might be a little bit too bright. Try that. Much better, this is perfect. We don't always go with the first pigment we mix. We keep working until we make it right. Doesn't have to be perfect in the beginning. We just have to have the dedication to it to see it through and make it what it is the potential to be. One of those lessons that just works in so many aspects of life, right? Here we have some unique separations. Softer blend. 
We never give up on finger painting. Doesn't matter how old we get. Which, by the way, I am about to turn 30. Which is kind of exciting. I feel like really enjoyed the 20s. Was able to do a lot, meet some amazing people, create hundreds of paintings, build this community with you. And I think that the decade of 30s will be really something special too. I always like to look at aging as a privilege rather than something to be afraid of. But with that, I'm curious, as somebody who is about to turn 30, big milestone. For those of you who have already done so, how did you spend your 30th birthday? Was it a time of reflection? Was it a time of planning? Was it a big vacation? I'm really not sure what I want to do yet. That said, I did do that, that thing a lot of us do, where I wrote down my 10 goals for the next decade of life. And some of them are just about being a better person, being as good of a person as I can be. Some of them are lofty and intimidating in all of the right ways. But I think we should always, always work on self-improvement, finding the best version of ourselves. And I feel like entering a new decade is a great way to just really give it our all, right? It's like a New Year's resolution, but it only happens every 10 years. So... Just looking for little ways to improve all that I'm already doing. Expand. And just be the best version of me that I can. I know we're not talking a lot about painting right now. <laughs> so here we'll just dive back into some highlights. We've been working with the shadows a great deal. We do need to go back and forth between the two. And I might simplify some of it just so it doesn't get too busy or complicated. I like how simplified that area is. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there. There we go. So this area protruding the most, it gets the most light, it gets a little bit darker as it comes down and it gets darker as it moves back and this area back and in. Said. I do want a lot of various values separating pieces. So there is still refinement to be done. So stepping back yet again, we can see some duality, some variance and we're going to step into this area. Then, finally, we get to start adding our details and making this really interesting, realistic, beautiful, diverse, all of those fun words. So, jumping here, I'm going in with a very similar pigment to what I used up here. You can just do a little test, make sure that it is in fact the same. And then, I'm actually going to apply it, as you can see, in what is for the most part, 
vertical strokes that, to a point, work inwards for the leading line effect. Just to draw the viewer's attention in the best way we can. And then I'll change the position of my brush. We'll wrap it around like this. We have a hard shelf, essentially, right through here. And then it becomes more of a dip inwards through this spot. So I'll just add a second layer, make sure it's nice and thick. And then we'll proceed to just add a little bit down here as well before we switch over to our more shadow dominant color. And this is something that we'll begin with up here because I want to work it into my still wet pigment. We could work in the larger negative space, but just for dry time's sake, I'm opting to begin at the top. And here we're looking for a similar look and aesthetic to what we rendered right through here. My brush is quite damp, so a lot of my pigment is very transparent, which is requiring multiple layers on my part. There we go. Lots of little taps. Lots of little taps. Remember? Keeping our brush strokes is actually a good thing. And I know you're quite far away, which is just so I could show you the entirety of the space. But from here, I'll move you in a bit closer and we'll proceed together. So from here, we grab a real abundance of our pigment. It's darker and we'll start working it towards the left hand side, blending it up into this top portion. We'll also make a much more red heavy mixture for the reflected light that comes up, similar to what we did on the other side. So I'm just incorporating a lot of extra burnt sienna, maybe a little bit of extra titanium white, You can see how nice and red that is. Though it definitely thins the pigment because burnt sienna is inherently very thin. It means we'll need a couple of layers. But the titanium white should help the mix. And you can see that it gets a little bit brighter as it comes from the shelf because that's a bit of a darker pigment. And then in the area where it becomes reflective, it gets brighter. We're very much in our messy stage. That's okay. There we go. Start bringing it down. Love that red rock adjacent to the green that we have. That would definitely needs to be more desaturated. So Mars black, titanium white, maybe a little bit more of the red. Just go back and forth between those in the mix until we have what we really need. We can also make this edge a bit more disheveled. That'll feel more natural. Bring that down. Blend into here. And into everything else that we've established. We still have this pocket which sticks out. It's a little bit brighter. And 
and you can see that I'm working, mixing fairly quickly just so that I can continuously blend as we have. As our layers build, we get something significantly more opaque as we desire. I want this edge to actually end up turning to be quite a bit brighter. And this I also want to be brighter. Do a bit of a soft blend back into the darker portion. A lot of working this pigment over time and time again. Go back for the brighter pigment, but we'll interject extra red into it. It's very bright, but it's actually quite bright in the reference photo too. And we'll blend it, so it'll actually probably be pretty perfect for what we're trying to achieve. Keeping those brush strokes prominent. Grab more. Line it with some highlight. Blend back set highlight. And then I'm going to speckle in that brightness amongst a lot of it. Like so. This area, significantly darker than any other portion we have, but that's actually really good because it makes it look more unique. It gives us an extra piece of interest. You don't feel like you've looked at one side and you understand the other. Now I'm just playing with that amount of highlight. I'll also take some of this muddy pigment and work it up into the top. However, the top is dry, so I'm getting a much more wet into dry application where the paint is a bit more toothy, which I actually like here simply because it gives the rock some texture. So yet again, stepping back, we take that wider look and something I realized very quickly is that I want more of this to be sharper and more highlighted. So I'm going to go in, apply the pigment to the very top, and then through a bit of a tap and a wet brush, I'm going to bring these in. Like that. I think I want to drop this down a little bit. Add some extra highlight up here. We can see that this highlight and this highlight are fairly different. We do need more of a yellow ochre in the very top not a grand amount more, but a little bit. That's where the light's hitting. We have this opportunity to build extra depth, and that's what we will do with this pigment. 
still using that sharper edge of the brush to accommodate. There we go. Might also add a little bit of an extra highlight down here. I did deviate from the reference photo a lot in this area specifically, but I wanted to keep it really simple. And I think we found the right balance on both sides of the painting. I'll make the traceable. I was going to make the traceable to the reference photo. I think I'm going to make the traceable to the actual painting, just because I am diverging in a couple of ways. I think that would be more beneficial for you. We finally get to start working on some of the details. We're going to want moss, we're going to want little plants, maybe flowers, but before we do that, we need texture within this rock. We're going to do so using the fan brush, same one that we used for this foliage. This time, we're going to go in with it dry because I want all of those tiny little speckled effects. I'm going to grab that same dark hue that we used in there, and I'm going to use it initially along some of our edges because there will be little indents, little punctures within all of our rock, right? Especially towards the edges because they won't be perfect edges. And it's our job here to start integrating those. We can also, as you can see, Bring that pattern upwards. I'm doing so more so more so towards the edge just because it's going to give us that vignette effect, but I'll also put it in the shadows through here subtly. I'm not using the entirety of my brush, just using the edge in which I need. and I'll just build on a little bit of that. Then I'll take my brush and I'll just wipe off the excess paint. We'll grab the highlighted pigment, and then with that same tapping effect, I'll work it down into that darker area. And if it's a little bit of a different hue, than what we previously had incorporated, that's actually not a bad thing. We can work that into the shadows, as there will be little bumps that stick out and catch extra light. And of course, We can bring that in as well. You can see it's a bit of a sporadic tap, especially once I have the majority of the pigment off the brush. Just letting that light leak in and connect with the rock. Now we'll finally head back to the other side for the first time in a while. And we can start tapping in these textures into the shadows. Remember, we don't need too, too many of them. And we start with the less is more approach. And this is a really easy way of turning soft, somewhat unnatural looking rocks into something that's much more textured. And initially, it'll look a little strange because these taps and dots will be 
designated to specific areas and it won't feel cohesive. But if you keep working at it, you actually get somewhere. So it's another one of those friendly reminders. We don't, we don't fear the process. We don't fear the obstacles. We embrace them because we know something great is right around the corner. This was a painting that I've been working on in parts, whether it be smaller versions or drafts or just mentally layering for quite some time, a couple weeks actually. And I was initially nervous a little bit about getting into it because I felt like I could probably paint it, but teaching it would be unique, right? And it was one of those things where like, once I just committed, started, gave it my all, it made sense, it worked. So. That's what we're doing. We are trying. Now we need the highlighted pigment. And we'll definitely need something a lot brighter than what I'm currently working with. But as you can see, my brush is starting to condense. You can probably see it better over here all of those little bristles, all of the paint is drying on it. So what I need to do is actually clean this brush, add water, and then I'm going to dry it fully so that I can get those nice sharp markings. Because remember when it's wet, they condense, you get the larger markings, it looks like this. That's what we want. So just make sure that in the process you do dry it well. Now I'm going to do a bit of this from a distance. That way you can see how dramatic or subtle it is from afar when you'll actually see it in a room, right? Because while we may paint really close up, that's not how most people view the pieces. And having that wider view is really important. Especially if you intend to hang it up, give it as a gift, sell it, right? So here, we're just going in with that same tapped effect, building up our textures. I think it's starting to look a lot more real and natural. Follow the lines. I'm also going to go in, I think, with a bit of a highlight that's brighter than what we currently have, but I want to be careful with that. I don't want too much of the speckling down here either, and I'm just using what I have left on my brush. I'm not grabbing new fresh paint because I want it to be subtle. Don't have much pigment left on my brush, so I can work a bit more freely, a bit more loosely. Just using about a third of it to touch canvas and apply this texture. That was probably a little too fast and loose there. <laughs> we'll just clean that up. Probably end up liking it more anyway. Now, as we move down farther, 
We need to make our highlights a little bit darker, maybe even a little bit more red, just because we're not going to have that same amount of golden light, the rocks that we do at the top. So we'll just simplify that a little bit. The darker pigment should still work well, but we can make it slightly more red, just like so. And we, of course, are mixing with the flat-headed brush because mixing with this one would condense all of the bristles in a way that we don't want. Now, also, as previously noted, I don't want too much detail and highlight in this area, but we can definitely work some in. I'm looking for the brightest points because this is slightly brighter than what we previously worked with. This is where it starts to feel special. Painting is one of those interesting things where in the very beginning it's so exciting and you're so enthusiastic about it, all right? It's brand new to you, you're learning, maybe you're a little nervous. There's a lot of feelings that are happening. And then as you start to get into it, start to notice little imperfections. And over time, if you stick with it, one of two things often happens. You start to learn how to work with them how to adapt, how to make it better. Or you actually end up just learning to love them. All the little scratches and unique markings that nobody else will notice, nobody else will care about, but you notice them and they mean something to you. When you look at that painting, you see so much more than what others might. That's because you stuck with it. You put in that time and that energy. Through the awkward phases. Because it really does start off as something you are excited about in a door. And then it turns into something that's a little intimidating, imperfect, and then you kind of find the perfection again later on. So, keep painting. <laughs> Even if it's awkward. If it's something you really want, you can figure it out and you can make it great. You just have to believe in what it can be. I feel like I'm starting to fall in love with all the little imperfections in here. Lists can also be useful. When you're painting, and you're trying to figure out how you feel about it, what areas you want to improve, what areas you feel are already exactly what you want, you can just write a little list. Look over the painting, top to bottom, be mindful of it. Just note all of the different things you love, and that will help you continue on 
because you'll see and you'll recognize and you'll take note of all of the good and that'll help you work through the awkward. We are not really sure how you feel. Ending up ended up adding more detail than I intended to but I'm really happy that I did. Now I'm just adding a little bit of that negative space. And of course, we have these rocks at the bottom, which could also use the extra texture now that everything else has it. Occasionally I will do a little bit of a drag just to make it a bit more messy, less uniform. Once we have all of these sharper tapped details, both in the dark and the light, we can start adding some greenery. We're going to do so by using a different technique that is glazing. And for it, we're going to want our larger flat headed brush because it can deliver pigment in a very uniform nature, it can mix paint well, and it'll just be the best option for beginning here. That said, we are going to grab our green for the first time in a while. I'll move that to a clean spot on the palette and we don't need much of it because we're going to thin it greatly. I'm going to grab about an equal mixture of the yellow ochre that'll give us a warmer green and then we're going to darken it with our Mars black which will also desaturate it a little bit. We'll grab some titanium white which will continue desaturating it but we'll of course brighten it and with that brighter pigment I'm going to darken yet again. So I have a fairly mid to dark green on the palette. I'm going to make my brush very watery and I'm going to spread that paint out. I'm going to grab more water from my brush. I'm going to spread that paint out until it looks like watercolor. You can see it's very transparent. You almost want it to the point where it can drip on the palette. And then we're going to head up into areas that might have a bit of moss or greenery. And we can apply this on them. You can blend it out with your brush or with your finger. I am opting for my finger. As you can see, I just like how it gives it a bit more of a naturally changing hue. That said, if you're wondering where we place this, for the most part, it needs to be on areas that are going to be receiving light because the moss will need that to grow, right? For the most part, it needs some.
And I'm trying to apply it little bits here and there. Initially, we can really expand should we want to later on. But this is going to connect a lot of the greenery here out into the rest of the painting. It's also worth noting when you're doing this, make sure that your hands are very clean. I like to wash mine with soap beforehand because if the oils on your hands are prominent, they can make it onto the canvas and so that you don't, or rather you can't, add paint to it because it's too much of an oily surface. So just make sure that you're washing your hands through the painting process. Quite a bit here. Looks like it's getting pretty cloudy though and dark. So I'll get you closer and I'll brighten up the camera. There we go. I fixed the lighting and it should look a bit more natural now. With that, we will grab some very watery green. Apply quite a bit, bit of it to the bottom here. Leaving this top part to be a bit more open and gold. I'm just going to do a little bit of tapping, make it spot. Trying not to overdo it. But to make it make sense. This isn't the only application and technique that we'll be using to apply green, but it's a very natural way of getting that pigment on there in the beginning. From here, we'll continue with our greenery by mixing up more of that same pigment, but we'll make it just a little bit brighter. And we might have it a bit more towards the yellow ochre side. Though we don't want it completely different. So here you can see the initial pigment. We definitely need more Mars Black. And when I'm mixing colors, typically in my head I ask myself, is it bright enough? Is it dark enough? So we ask about value. And then we ask if it's saturated enough. So if it needs to be more saturated, we add more of the actual hues. If it needs to be less saturated, it's either titanium white and Mars black in conjunction, or it's the opposite color on the color wheel. So. Here, we are just opting for the titanium white and Mars black option, but I am switching to the fan brush and quickly learning that it is too saturated for our setting. And I want it to be just a little bit brighter. So, titanium white to desaturate, going to make it warmer. And in the process of making it brighter, desaturating it, we need to make it a little bit darker. So it's still brighter than what it was. It's less saturated now though. And I'll try this. Yet again, admittedly, not exactly what I want for the highlights, but it'll work really well in the shadows. 
So we'll do that first. And it's very similar to what we were doing previously with the rocks. We don't have a lot of moss in the shadows, in the deep shadows rather, but we will have a little bit. And this is where we can make use of our current pigment. We can also have it be kind of a draped plant. We'll make one of those right here. Not a part of the reference photo, but I think a really neat addition in a way of bringing greenery back into the center. Keeping it nice and sharp. Little taps in the highlighted areas as well. They're still a bit more golden. It's unifying the piece well. Now yet again, We'll brighten it and we'll make it warmer. And we just continuously move in that direction while we apply new layers on top of previous layers. Love that. That's what we wanted for the highlights. It's natural, works with the rest of the painting. It's a great green. Build some depth on here. Let the darker portion still show underneath so that it's nice and three dimensional. Just bouncing around. Try not to do too much in any one area. It's a very cathartic process. One of my favorite words for painting, I think, but it's kind of difficult to stop once you get started. Now, with the advent of what we have right here, I think it's time we start incorporating more of this type of foliage throughout it. So something that's a bit larger, perhaps something that has a drape to it, it can work its way over the rocks at dimension. So we'll go with a darker variant of a yellow dominant green. Good amount of Mars black. Oh, we have lightning. And thunder. Can you hear that? That's fun. We'll mix up a fairly dark one. And we will switch our brush. We'll be applying the new foliage with our liner brush because it is just so fine and detail oriented. But we'll begin with our darker hue right up here and then I'll have it work its way down on the rock and then I can kind of pull its foliage on the landing of the next rock. I'm doing all this through taps and then I can start to drape again 
to a greater degree. And I'll actually do quite a bit of this. Grab some extra Mars black. And we'll just work that through here. Have a little bit up on this side. You can cut in between the rock, make it a bit more unique. And then while we don't typically mix with this brush, we don't need a lot of pigment, so we can here. I'm going to make it yellow dominant, add the titanium white and the yellow ochre. Then we'll just tap on all of these little markings. We can always use the fan brush if we feel like we're not getting a tiny enough application, but you can also do that after you've done this. That way you have multiple layers, multiple sizes, stroke applications. It'll just make it a more diverse painting. There we go. Brighten it again. Not sure if you can hear the rain outside, but it's quite relaxing. We can also take this opportunity to mix up color akin to what we had in the top here. And we can further Dramatize it. Now that we have more detail everywhere else, I know that I can add more detail up here. But that was a lesson that came only with putting in the time. really trying to build. Let's take this actually. Let's just do a little bit of it down here. Applying as little pressure as I possibly can with my brush. Letting it dissipate as I work down. There we go.
really, really starting to like our additional forms. So stepping back, I'm actually really happy with where it's at. And there are definitely places for improvement. We can add more highlights, detail, texture, flowers, branches. There's a lot to build on, but what we have right now I think is strong. And before I add the rest of those details, I want to work on this area first just so I can understand balancing with that. So we are going to probably clean our water and brushes quite well at this point. We've been painting for a long time. We don't want that pigment drying on our brushes. And we also don't want to work with too diluted uh, water. So let's take a time, uh, let's take some time, clean all of that, and then we'll get right back to it. So our brushes are clean as is our water and we are going to endeavor into the actual waterfall. Now I'm going to begin with the Filbert brush. So this one has nice rounded edges, very soft and great for blends, things like mist, clouds, all of that. This will have that water kind of spraying out. So this is a great brush to do our base layer and then we'll do our details with another brush. That said, we are going to begin with a very simple palette of titanium white and the smallest hint of Mars black, taking off the excess Mars black in another part of the palette, just because you can see it's extremely strong. Blend that up, get a nice bright gray. And then I'm going to do the same thing that I did with the glazing, and that I'm going to grab a lot of water and I'm going to work that into the mixture. Now from there, I'm gonna take my pinky finger, ground it on the canvas to eliminate shake from my hand. I'll create the top of where the water is going to be falling from. It should be very transparent. And then in the middle of the waterfall, I'll create this line down, okay? From there, I start expanding out to the left and right. And if I have a lot of pigment or water on my brush, I'll wipe it off on a cloth before proceeding. But here, as you can see, we're just slowly building up the opacity of the falling water. We can use that rounded edge of the brush on the edges to soften them. We can also use our finger. There will be a lot of extra mist towards the bottom. So working in those circular motions. Working it behind those rocks. There we go. Now, from there, we want to build on it. So a bit more of that water on this brush. And at the top, I'm going to start tapping. And this will render the beginning of our detail. I'm looking to do this in the areas that are already more opaque, that will have naturally formed in the first application. It's getting very bright in this room. I guess all the clouds cleared up. It's nice. So, looks like we're going to have one of those afternoons where it's very bright and it's very dark and it's very bright, which is always interesting for our paintings because it means we get to see what it'll look like on the rainy days, but also the sunny days. 
it makes articulating values a little bit more difficult as I'm sure it just got a lot darker in the room and also on camera. But we're essentially looking for those larger clusters. We're building them up little bit by little bit, adding to the more grand opacities. Really happy with how this is turning out. Grab a bit more. I'm very much still trying to keep portions transparent. Little spots falling uniquely on their own. It's not all done through drags, but a lot of it's done in taps with the rounded edge of this brush, letting it kind of feather itself naturally. Going back, building the highlight predominantly at the top because that's where it will be receiving its light. And it should dissipate as we get farther down in terms of brightness. I think it just got quite dark again. If you ever need to paint and you're worried about it getting brighter and darker on and off, doing so at night with proper bulbs, proper lights, is a great way of going about it. Now I'll be switching to a liner brush. We'll remix some of our gray. We're not mixing a lot of paint, so we can use a liner brush for it. I'm going to get the excess pigment off my brush, make sure that it's nice and damp. That way our bristles are condensed and we get a semi-transparent application. And I'll work the fine details into the top. And then also interject them into the larger areas. Lots of little taps. Before it was the elongated vertical taps. Now we have the individual dots. It's almost like drawing with pointillism. There are areas that won't have any of the dots. Those are predominantly the more open areas. You know when you're working on a piece and you feel like there's some, uh, there's some magic in it? And there, it's this piece. I'm going to really embrace that feeling.
also going to add some water on the rocks that are close to it. They will have that buildup of the splashed water and mist from the edges. We don't want it to be too bright, but we do want to acknowledge that these edges will get wet. And they will require highlight for that water. So we're just working it along the rocks, along the moss, anything really that could collect water or could drain off of. It's these little details that collectively make a big difference. There we go. Now here we are from a bit of a distance and we're just still trying to build this up without making it too, too much. It's definitely a balance to be found. Lots of tapping towards the bottom. Still want the greater highlights on top, and then it can get progressively a little bit darker, and then here, I feel like is where it should be darkest, and then we can make it brighter again towards the bottom. Because we're going to have a bit of a crash, water into the water, and that'll create mist, and more opaque layering. We'll also have water on here. So we can add that highlight towards the edge, have it dissipate as it moves towards the left. You can find itself in little granular pockets of the rock. And this one should also be wet. There we go. Now, much like all of the rock, the foliage, branches, details, the waterfall could use more detail. We can add to it, but I don't want to until we've established what we have down here. So I'm back with the larger flat-headed brush. I'm going to make sure it's nice and damp. And then we're going to render a green initially for right through here. We'll do so with about an equal mixture of our green and our yellow. We'll make it nice and dark so that we can build on top of it little bit of titanium white because it's definitely too saturated. And I think we can go just a bit darker. Now we'll give it a try by just placing it in using that flat headed brush. It's great because we can cover so much surface area quickly. We will have to go back and paint the water actually falling onto it later on, but that's expected. 
And here, it should be quite dark as this area just is very tight. It's not getting a lot of opportunity for light. So as you move out, we'll just make it a little bit brighter. Like so. Again, we work our edges first. My brush is damp, which is how I'm able to get this much pigment to glide across the canvas. Do a nice blend into that darker application. And then once we get to this point right about here, we'll do one more slight line of it, but we'll keep it softer so I don't have a hard edge. And we'll switch pigments. Now I'm going to go into a much more red dominant pigment. So I have my burnt sienna, about a third of that in the burnt umber. Mars black because we also want this to be darker. Titanium white because we want it to be thicker and less saturated. Just go back and forth. That pigment looks great. So I start applying it and already I can tell, you know what, I do want it to be brighter. Brighter and more red. So we'll try this. Love that. that, is what we are looking for. And I can work it in between a lot of these rocks, but it's okay because now I can always just go back and redraw the rocks. Not letting it touch the green initially. I wanna get as much surface area of it before we dilute with the green, but I also want to work quickly because I know that the green is drying. Also, this will require a couple of layers because the burnt sienna is so thin. But then once I have the majority of it on there, we let the blending process begin. And that's just through the center. For the most part, it's horizontal strokes, as you can see. But I also work into a bit of an X-shaped pattern. That way I can bring pigment up and down rather than just left and right. Grab more green for here. We'll grab more of the reddish brown. Just continue that blend. Looking in the camera, it all looks exceedingly dark. It looks a little bit brighter in person. I think when the sun comes out again, you'll take note of that. But I'll also move you a bit closer in just a second so that you can see it to a greater degree. Recognize my hand is likely in the way for a lot of this, but because of the dry time, I kind of just have to paint efficiently, regardless of the camera placement. Now what we'll do is create a brighter brown than what we have here. Not by a lot, but we want to start building our highlights in the rocks that can be seen underneath the small amount of water. So I'm using the larger flat-headed brush to do the blending, do the mixing here. Still wanted to have a bit of our yellow, but the red base is definitely the most important part. And we're really just trying to find our color before we end up mixing too, too much of it. I think this will work quite well. Put that brush down, we'll switch to our smaller flathead brush, make that nice and wet. From there, we can start creating all of the little rocks that you'd see. 
underneath the water. And when I have fresh paint, I begin to deliver it in the foreground, as we did, and then I let it dissipate as we move backwards. So that way it gets more transparent. And we're leaving little bits of space in between a lot of them. That way it looks like the rocks are protruding as they get higher. They catch that light underneath the water. And the more layers we build up, the more prominent that pigment will be. So we want to be careful not to do too many in the distance here, but we can do more and more in the foreground. Just like that. They also get larger as you move towards the foreground. And we'll just continue building it up. If we accidentally ever do too much, it's as easy as remixing the base color and simplifying with that. Don't be afraid of failure. Here I'll get you a little bit closer. And we'll just continue working these throughout our negative space. Trying to make them somewhat unique, though for the most part, we are sticking to horizontal applications, which bend down on both sides. Something else we can do to diversify though is to change the actual sizing, make some larger ones here and there. Make some smaller ones. Now I'll start building them up through the second layer and make it higher. From a distance, I think it looks significantly more subtle. And it's good to observe from the distance. That way you can tell if areas need significantly more attention or if we're kind of overdoing it in one spot or another. Here, I'm really trying to be mindful of all of that. We can also hold our brush farther back, paint from more of a distance. That'll help us with the randomization factor, similar to the foliage that we worked on earlier. I am placing this up into the green. So, grabbing our pigment yet again. It's a little bit brighter here. Every time we layer on top of our previous applications, it will become so. trying to keep nice sharp tops to these applications. Trying to make sure that they're not messy. There we go. I think these are building up really nicely. They've had the most layers and I think it really shows.
We can also use just the corner of our brush when we need to start making it smaller. As we get farther and farther away from us. We can also switch to the liner brush when we feel that is a necessary endeavor. getting really bright here, I'm going to start being more cautious. Might also do a little bit of a blend, though do be careful if you are doing those blends. Because it might make it look softer than you want it to. This is quite desaturated as is a lot of the painting. Because of all that we have going on, it can look busy easily. And we're just trying to mitigate that risk. I think all of the natural earthy colors will also be much better, if not presented in excess. Grab that pigment. We always like to start closer to us, get the majority of that paint off the brush so it dissipates, so it's darker, at least visually. The paint itself isn't darker, but it appears darker because it's more semi-transparent. There's more water on the brush to paint, and that darker pigment on the canvas shows through to a greater degree. As we get farther back, our applications will get more sparse as they do small. We'll also occasionally go back and connect a couple of pieces. Just make those markings in the foreground feel like they're in the foreground through size. And now, over to our left-hand side, beginning with these larger rocks. I can tell my paint's already starting to run out, so I will move upwards, progressively making them smaller. Grab more paint, use the initial stripes down here. Then we'll proceed as we have. You notice that the process does get a lot faster as you go, just because you've had that practice, you're familiar, and it just gets a lot easier. And at a certain point, we can just work our way 
across the green, just intermittently splashing in these hues. We can also make it a little bit darker as we move farther back. Just like that. Sometimes the water moves in such a way, even in the distance, where you do get the hint of them. That said, we're going to do a lot to make this look like water. This is really only the first step. We do want to be subtle with this next portion, so I'm going to keep you a bit farther back just so you can see the amount of detail that is ideal. We'll mix up a variant of what we've been using, but we'll make it slightly brighter than what it was. The base hue should still be that burnt sienna, that nice red, like so. We switch over to the liner brush because it is the only brush small enough to accomplish what we really want to here and we're making our brush fairly damp to make the applications also semi-transparent. And we're just adding extra detail to the tops of all of the rocks that could be receiving additional light. And I heavily recommend painting this from a little bit farther away and continuously taking those steps back because it's easy to overdo it. And this is just one of those steps that's meant to be a slight aid, not a dramatic change, right? I think I may have done a little bit too much there, but that's okay, we can always walk it back. The markings can be softer as we're farther away. Also, while I do recommend being farther away, I do want to just show you technique-wise what this looks like up close. And in a lot of cases, it's a series of taps, not necessarily a drag. That way we get a more textured look for the rock. And we don't want it to be as textured as what we have in the surroundings, because it is underwater. It will have that almost softening filter to it. But we still want it to have that same volume and idea of shape. So, doing this predominantly for the ones closer to the center, as they are the most visually prominent. Like everything else, as I always say, could we do more? Yes. Do I want to until we do more elsewhere? Also yes. So I'm back with the liner brush. I'm going to grab titanium white, 
hint of Mars black. And what could we be working on with just these two pigments? If you guessed the waterfall, you're correct. So, now we need to make this look like it's falling into here and eliminate that hard edge and line that we previously created. So this is going to take a lot of tapping at the bottom. As it is falling, crashing, hitting that water. And then from there, once we get to the base, we start working our way out in what is extremely small, horizontal, movements as it will move the water forward even if it's somewhat shallow and it will create a reflection and this accomplishes the start of both of those. We want it much more condensed in the center and as we get towards the edges our brush strokes can be more loose We'll go back to the center multiple times to really build it up. Using incredibly thin paint, as I'm sure you can tell. Let's get you closer though. So, continuing. Up close, you can probably tell that looks fairly messy. That's because it is. We need to wait for it to dry though, to a point before we can go back in like I am here and add more. So there will be patience required. And then we build out that water again, typically aiming to apply to the previous markings. Like so. And then we spread it out. I'm also going to run a bit of this water along the edge of this rock and the water. I'll do that on this side as well. Have it dissipate as you move farther and farther away from the actual waterfall. Now, as we get really close, I think this area is getting a bit too dense and I'll probably need to open it up again. I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. But for now, I'm continuing to work forward with the water. And I'll also tap little bits of it on the outskirts. Especially when we overlap what we have in the foreground, it will start looking much more like water, really. If 
being careful, spacing it out, but also creating little patterns and clusters occasionally. Trying to keep these really small. It's easy to expand them. We can always go back to do that. We can also add that highlight to the top of some of these rocks to make it look like it's actually just coming out of the water a little bit for the larger ones. But we aren't done up here. I was just waiting for that to dry. go. Now I'm liking it from a distance, but again, I do feel like we need to open that area back up and I'm going to do so with the liner brush. I'll just mix up a little bit of our Mars black, our brown, white. I think we'll do more burnt umber than we will burnt sienna, but we will have a hint of burnt sienna. We can just Work that back in here. It needs to be a bit more gray heavy. Just opening up the waterfall through taps and a couple of drags. Once that dries, we can go over it with a little bit of soft white and it'll look just like the rest of it. Now, before we proceed to the rocks in the foreground, I want to build this up just a little bit more. We're going to do so with the larger flat-headed brush, which I will make sure is nice and damp. By the way, my brushes and palette, water, all of that, very clean right now, so nothing will be diluted. I'll take some titanium white hint of Mars black, taking off the excess elsewhere. We will thin it down dramatically to the point where it is like watercolor. And then I'm just going to go right under the waterfall. And move that forward. So it dissipates as it gets down. And it's just a really quick and easy way of building up additional highlight in that space. You can go back and add more towards the actual waterfall. You can add just a little bit in the foreground. But we don't want too much in that spot. From there, we are going to continue with the titanium white hint of Mars Black. This time, not so watery. We'll put that brush down, switch over to the liner brush, and by liner I mean fan. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll go in with some taps, horizontally, in this space, just give it a bit of a, a sheen, a sparkle, a splash. Like that. Grab additional titanium white. That was actually quite watery still, just because I was working in the area that we had previously diluted. So 
so. A little bit more of this nice gray white. The fan brush is entirely dry, by the way, so I'm getting a lot of sharp markings. We can also apply it vertically into the waterfall, and that can be a great look. Just add that additional level of detail. And then as I have almost no paint, I go towards the edges. From there, we can start working on the rocks along the bottom. I'm going to deviate quite dramatically from the reference photo. I do still want rocks that come out of the water. I think that adds great depth, but I felt like they were a little busy in the photo. So we're going to do larger, more amalgamated ones so that they're also just a bit more cohesive with what we have up here. So I can tell that it's actually quite dark in the viewfinder. Let me just brighten that for you. And let's get back to it. Now, I want the top of the rock to be a mixture between our burnt sienna and our yellow ochre. It's a nice orange. We'll desaturate it dramatically with titanium white and Mars black. We'll also make it earthy with our burnt umber. I think we need to go just a, a bit darker for the first layer. And I'm mixing up a decent amount because we have a lot of rock to cover. So once I have that pigment, we'll mix our darker variant Mars black, this mixture, and we can just grab those previous pigments as well. We are in the true foreground, so we can have it be slightly darker than everything else has been. The contrast can be higher. And with this, we can apply it with a larger flat-headed brush should we want to. I'm essentially thinking about where the tops of the rocks are and how to best apply these shadows. So if there's an open spot of canvas, I try to make the bottom of it this darker pigment and maybe even the back of it to a point. There we go. From there, take off the excess, grab our highlight. And we'll start mixing down. We'll bring the darker hues up. Now this is going to look very basic in relation to all of our other rock because of course we don't have the greenery on it, we don't have the tapped effects, we are missing a lot of those key detail features. So don't get discouraged when it isn't perfect initially. I know I said that a lot in this lesson, but it's an important lesson, right? For everything. We put the time in, and that's how we build something we can really care about.
There we go. Now, this will start to dry on me fairly soon, at which point we'll probably interject a bit more water on the brush just to keep it all wet for a slightly prolonged period. It'll also help with a wet and a dry blend should we need it. So I'll grab that water now, go back, grab my pigment. And we'll just mold these together. We'll also be making it so that these dip into the water in a later stage. That'll be visually interesting. But for now, we just need our basics. And here you can see that I'm essentially not bringing up any of that darker hue. It is essentially dry. So I might just put a little bit of it at the bottom towards the back. Go back, grab the highlight, do the blend. Then head over here. I do want the rock on this far left hand side to be very diluted in pigment. I want it to be muddy. That way it's not too bright and it doesn't draw the eye out of the painting. Now that we have our base layer, we'll make a brighter variant of the highlight we just had. We still want it to be earthy. Just like that. Put down our larger flat-headed brush. Pick up our smaller flat-headed brush. And we can start working on some slight highlights towards the tops of these. Generate more distinctive form. Trying to do a bit of a pitter-patter effect in different areas so that we still accomplish a level of texture. I don't want a lot of it on this rock because it's towards the edge. I like that a lot of these feel more flat and that's something that I'm trying to continuously work with the idea of. And we make them more flat by not making the top too bright and not doing too much of a rounded motion like that. I'm actually going to walk that backwards. Make it part of the rock behind. Doesn't need to be extremely dark, but we do have that opportunity here, unlike anywhere else. There we go. Now we'll do a little migrating over to the left hand side of the canvas.
a little quiet through here just as I define our forms. So once we've established our general forms, we're going to add some extra highlight to our already highlighted pigment. Mix that up well. Do a little test to make sure that it's not too bright in relation to the rest of the painting. I think it might be slightly too saturated. So I'll just add a hint of Mars Black. It will darken it a hint, but I feel like it's already bright enough. And we'll switch to the fan brush. And we'll just tap in that nice rock texture that we did along the walls previously. This is not much brighter at all than what I previously had, which I actually like a lot. I'd much rather almost not see it at all and then build on it with two or three, four layers and have it be hyper prominent in the beginning and not really give myself the opportunity to build. There we go. Okay. Now we go brighter. I just slowly interject. Oh, there we go. That's beautiful. Not doing too, too much of it. And it does dissipate as I move towards the edges. Because I don't want too much attention there. But. We definitely want that build, even on the edges. Getting into very bright territory here. I know the rocks might look a little tricky, but you do start to get the hang of it pretty quickly. Now we'll take that same fan brush and the darker hue that we use for the shadows. We'll apply that into those bottom darker portions and continue to create texture. Uh, we do need to be careful with it because it is a lot darker than our highlight and we want to separate them as best we can for the most part. We will do a mix of the two for our next application. Really try to bring them together. So we'll grab that darker hue. We'll mix a new one in between. I think that actually looks really nice. Now, as we step back, I think it's quite evident that we really do need to work on the highlights for them. So titanium white, yellow ochre, and more titanium white this time than a yellow ochre more burnt umber than burnt sienna because I want these to not be hyper saturated. The light that is hitting them will dilute that saturation to a point. And we do still need some Mars black. So we'll try this. 
And I'll start with the liner brush. And we'll go in, we'll place that towards the top, doing it in a bit of a speckled manner. Just like so. If we make it really bright and lean into the titanium white, it will look like it's water that's on there and it is a sheen. You don't have to do that, but it is an option. Now, I also recognize we've been painting for quite some time. If you've made it this far, just want to say congratulations. You've shown that you are certainly dedicated to the craft, and I hope that you're taking a lot of ideas and techniques that you can work not only into this piece, but also other ones. I'd also like to say a big thank you to everybody up over on Patreon for making lessons like this happen. In no world could I put this much time and planning into a lesson if it wasn't for you and your direct support. The channel is predominantly community funded and I just want to say a big thank you for that. It's a real pleasure to be able to take a couple weeks and plan something like this out. It's a lot in the planning process. And again, it's because of you that this lesson happened. We actually did a poll over on the Patreon exclusive Facebook group where I asked which lessons you'd like to see done next. The lightning lesson came in second, but I did that first because I knew this just needed more time. But once I saw the amount of enthusiasm for this one, I wanted to do it on a larger canvas and I wanted to really just make sure it was as good as it could be. I'll also note, for those of you who may be new here, I feel like I've talked about the traceables a couple of times and I just mentioned that group. If you haven't checked it out, up over on Patreon you can get the traceables for all of these to help you with the drawing process if you feel like you really like painting but the drawing element is a, a little tricky, you're not so much a fan of it. You can get the traceables up there. I also put the reference photos and photos of all of the materials that I'm using. So you can see all of that. You can also get access to all of the ebooks, including Acrylics for Beginners, which is essentially the essentials. Everything you need to know about acrylic painting before you jump into your first acrylic painting. We talk about what brushes to use, how to work with water, different color combinations, all of that good stuff. There are also a bunch of ebooks full of traceables up there. Some of flowers, others of landscapes. And there are over a hundred bonus lessons, so ones that you won't find up on YouTube. Some of them are really quite big, 24 by 36 inch canvases. Those are always fun series. They end up being <laughs> about 10 hour lessons, but it's one of those things where you can really just put that time in and make something big, make something you can be extremely proud of. Feel that way about this one already. It's not that big, but it's definitely <laughs> taken some time and a lot of thought. That said, you can also, again, uh, back to it, get access to our exclusive Facebook group where everybody shares their renditions of these pieces, ask questions. It's an incredibly positive, supportive community. Even when I'm too busy planning or painting, the rest of the community likes to help each other and figure out the best way to move the paintings forward. You get to see different ideas and iterations to these, so that's fun. I also do monthly 
art critiques for people at the highest here. So if you want a video of me looking at a photo of your work and talking about it for 10, 20 minutes, that's also, it's also an option. But there's a link to Patreon in the, the video description. Don't feel like you have to do it <laughs> at all. I, I just, I appreciate you being here and I hope you're having fun learning things. But for those of you who want the extra help, be it with the drawing or through the ebooks or through the community, through the critiques, just know that that is an option for you. And again, big thank you to everybody who is up there. For those of you who make it to the end of the lesson, you know that there's a little card that I like to put up with everybody's names from the, I believe, Mighty Oak and Great Wide Open tier, just as a way to commemorate the support and thank you very openly and directly. I think we need some greenery on these rocks. I think that's the next step. Actually, before we start adding the greenery, I do want to elongate some of these rocks into the water. So how I'm going to do that is I'll grab the burnt umber, burnt sienna, Mars black, titanium white. I want this to be a bit more of a earthy gray mixture. We can still have a little bit of the yellow ochre but it definitely needs to skew more towards the red while being more gray. And from there, we did properly match the undercolor, which is great. Now we just make it slightly darker. A little bit more Mars black. And then, right under our rocks, we can kind of extend it and then let it dissipate as it works down. And just let it essentially turn into nothing. that we can really see. Then we switch brushes to the liner, take some titanium white, mix it with a little bit of burnt umber, maybe a little bit of our red into the Mars black. And then we can just do a little tap around the base of some of these. And it's not tracing the entirety of the outline of the bottom. It's just showing that there's a separation. And this will just make the visual of it make a little more sense. So once our rocks are fully dry to the touch, we can switch over to the larger flathead, make sure that it's nice and damp. We'll grab some of our green, about an equal mixture of our yellow ochre. Work those two together. We'll desaturate it with titanium white and Mars black, significantly more titanium white than Mars black. But we do want a bit of a darker green and I think I want it to be a bit more yellow dominant. So here you can see it's a bit more of a, an olive. We'll make sure our brush is very wet. We'll thin out that pigment, add more water. You can see that it's slowly turning into a wash. 
And then we'll do a little test. on the tops of these rocks. Again, you can blend it out with the brush if you'd like. But I do like the added control my finger adds. Looks like it got a lot darker in the room. I'll just fix that for you. There we go. And we'll apply it to this side. Here I'm just using the corner of the brush to tap it on in a lot of different spots. That way it isn't too consuming in any one area. This really does add a lot. It's definitely more cohesive with the rest of the piece. And it stands out nicely against all of the reds within the water. Yet again, switching the uh, switching the camera lighting. It's actually a, a new day, and it's another one of those days where the clouds are very inconsistent. So it might occasionally get a little brighter, a little bit darker. I think that's all right. There we go. Now let's mix up a slightly brighter variant. Can I have a bit more yellow yet again? Just like so. Grab our dry fan brush. Build on those tapped highlights for moss. Just using about a third of the brush, not the entirety of it. Not adding much. Really like what we were able to add with that. Now, yet again. We will continue to build up that green. We'll use the green itself, yellow and titanium white, making it quite bright in relation to what we've used. But this will tie the very top of the painting down at the bottom because we have those bright greens up there, right? So I'll just tap these in. Another addition that I think could actually work really nicely down here is a short warm grass. So we'll grab a little bit of the green, about double that, if not more, of our yellow ochre. We'll desaturate it with a lot of titanium white a little bit of Mars black. If we need to re-interject color, we can do so with the yellow. And I think that'll be a great pigment to work grass in. So back to the fan brush. And with it, I'm just going to do really tiny controlled strokes. Not placing it on the entirety of the rocks, just the areas that have an abundance of green. That way we have some areas that are just a little bit green and they're mossy. We have some areas that have a grass to them. We can also throw a little bit of it over here. Just another unique addition, right? Very good. That said, with the grass, I think we can also add flowers. So, let's do that. 
Now we are going to stay creative, as we tend to do here, with the additions of what you can see drawn here with the orange Conte, the green Conte. It's scattered about, but there are things that weren't in the reference photo that I feel like will really build the canvas well. We have this singular linear piece, this vertical subject, and I want more to complement it. So we're going to interject a tree through here, and we'll start with a darker mix of our Mars black, titanium white, make a good gray. We do want it to be earthy though. So we'll interject both of our browns, even a little bit of green, just like so. Really quite dark. Very thick pigment. And then we'll switch over to our smaller flathead brush. Make sure that's nice and damp. And with this, we should be able to just cut along very smoothly. I'm not making a singular elongated stroke. I'm making a lot of smaller ones. And this is just going to make the branch, the tree, look a lot more natural. We want those divots and those unique portions. We are working around our previously crafted rocks, so we want to be careful. And this is just the base layer. For the one right beside it, which is quite a bit smaller, we're switching to the liner brush. And much like the last, while we could do this in a singular stroke, we are not going to. Also going to frequently grab more water. And just like that, it is dark again. <laughs> One of those days. That's okay. If it becomes ever a little too visually dramatic through the changes, I will attempt to edit that in post. That said, for now I think we're actually quite good. Looks very natural in the viewfinder. Now here, we're just kind of freestyling a little bit. You won't be if you're using the traceable because it will be drawn in there so you don't have to figure it out. But right now I'm just trying to create leading lines that push the eye towards the center of the painting. Keep them nice and tiny. Also trying to be cognizant of the fact that there is rock right above it so it can't grow too high and it likely will essentially all move this way and that way. Because it's so watery, a lot of it's thin to the point where it definitely needs a second layer. Extremely transparent applications. I'm just trying to articulate how we should proceed. But I want them to have a lot of overlap. I want smaller offshoot branches. And we don't want it getting too high. As we look back towards the top, we will go with the flat-headed brush again, as we need to cover some larger space. When I want the stroke to be larger, I just increase the pressure on the brush. That opens up the bristles and expands them. Just 
just like so. Now we have this through line. I'm also going to use the sharper edge of it to start crafting an offshooting branch, which will be quite visually dramatic over the open sky. Trying really hard to keep these strokes extremely small. We can put foliage on these if we want, or we can leave them open. There isn't really a right or wrong with it. It's about the amount of detail you want to work into your piece. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm not continuously doing the same thing over and over again. We are aiming for progress. I'm going to leave the smaller portions of the branches semi-transparent so it looks like the light is wrapping around it. But these larger pieces in the body of the branches we do make those more opaque. There we go. Recognize my hand is likely in the way. <laughs> Try to fix that. You can see at a certain point it just becomes a tap when the branch should be extremely small. Very good. Now we'll make a slightly brighter variant using our two browns in equal mixture and titanium white. We don't want it to be too bright, but definitely brighter than what it was. And we can apply this to the side which is facing the light through a series of taps. It can be on both sides of branches like this because the light's going to come down on them on both sides and what we're seeing is actually underneath which will be the darkest point. We'll brighten it likely one more time because we don't want it to end up actually being bright. We just want to see that light work its way around our branches. The same idea and general application can and should be done down here. Applying the highlight to the side that's facing the open area it can dissipate as we get farther down. Just do a second application, build it up towards the top. You can even do little taps inside to create the effect of bark as we run out of paint. Very subtle though. And we'll switch to the liner brush for this one. However, it is very much under the rock so it won't be receiving much light at all. This is just an incredibly subtle addition. 
We'll place it on the tops of all horizontal branches. And from a distance, you can see that it's almost unnoticeable, which isn't a bad thing. Just keeping it all is an extra little detail to complement the piece, but it doesn't have to demand the attention. That said, I do want a tree just like this on the other side. So let's, let's move the camera down a little bit and get started on that. Now for this, we are jumping back to the medium sized flat headed brush. I do have my drawing worked in here. I'm making the strokes individually. I'm applying additional pressure as I work my way down. As you can see, it's getting larger. And I think I'll probably expand these to be larger than I drew them. But I wanted to start small and just make sure that we liked the general idea because I can still cover this up should I need to. Should I decide I don't actually like it? But I think I actually kind of love it. So I think we opt for more, not less. Go. Then we have smaller branches. And this should show up fairly well because we have a lot of highlight in this area. And the general contrast will be very much our friend. Also, before we add our highlights, I am going to do one of these over here. I don't want it to end at the exact same spot as either of those, so I think I'll go in the middle. And just paint this as we did the other. Right down here. It'll create this nice balance and duality with both halves of the painting. Establish extra depth. And offer some additional unity, right? It also gives us more of these vertical pieces to work well with the waterfall. And also take this as an opportunity to work on some small branches for the bottom. Just add a level of detail that isn't in the other side. Keep it interesting. Really love how this is turning out.
from there, I think what we'll do is we'll switch back to the larger flat. We'll make a brighter variant of that pigment, but still not too bright. And using the smaller flat headed brush. We'll now work in the highlight. On the trees on the right hand side, the highlight will be on the left hand side of them. For the trees on the left hand side, the highlight will be on the right hand side. Because of where the light is and the fact that it's very centralized. Here I did the edge and now I'm just going back up and doing little taps to establish hints of bark. It's a small tree though, so it won't have too prominent bark. From there, we'll head over here. Turn these from silhouettes into actual subjects. Have that light wrapping around them. Interject texture. Though our texture will come in the form of a different brush. Curious to know if you can guess what that brush is. What do we use when we want to work with texture? Not sure how much you can see this from a distance, but it is one of those things that's meant to be very subtle. So if you're having a hard time with it, that just speaks to the fact that when you're painting it, you should keep in mind that it isn't a dramatic addition at all. Remember for horizontal branches, we apply it to the top and for the sides of them, it's whatever side correlates with the light of the actual tree. This is really small. I don't know that I should really add much highlight to this at all. There we go. Now we'll head back up in the canvas because I want to extend some of this draping foliage, which of course is done with a Mars black, our green, equal part yellow ochre, a little bit of titanium white. We are building the base layer, it needs to be the darkest. So I'll make it just like that. And I can actually apply this with our larger flat-headed brush by just tapping downwards. Though I paint on a bit of an angle because I film, and because of that, I find it difficult sometimes to assess what is actually draping directly downwards. So do make sure that you move around your canvas so you can find how that should look naturally. And I'm doing this through a couple of different spots. I really liked the look and I felt like we incorporated these more vertical pieces with the trees, but we could definitely do more with this as well. And it's so unique. It's something that we don't normally get to incorporate in painting, so I feel like it's something to play with and enjoy. There we are. Now, from there, I think we'll make it a, a brighter variant. Extra titanium white yellow ochre, our green, got bright quite quickly because we're using an abundance of paint. So we'll just go back and forth. I think that's close to what we want. A Little bit brighter, a little bit more green. Perfect. For this, however, I'm going to switch back to the liner brush. And I'll tap this on the 
right hand sides of the falling foliage for the most part. And I do mean tap. I'm not doing a lot of a drag here. I want it to be textured. Also, while we're not at the end, we are definitely getting closer to it. And if you've been following the channel for a while, you know that I like to give a little keyword, something you can leave in the comments at the end to know that you are one of the on average 13% who makes it to the very end. And I was looking at this painting and I was thinking about all the different wildlife that might inhabit it. About all of the neat bats and whatnot. I was talking to somebody the other day and they noted that they were that they were in a bat club. And I thought that was so neat. What a, what a fun hobby. I was a little jealous, to be honest. And I think just a unique word that nobody would think to incorporate in a regular sentence would be club. So, just you can type the word club in the comments, or you can incorporate it into a sentence. You can tell me about a maybe a painting club you are in, or you, you wish you were in. Perhaps you feel like you're in one here, but you know, I for one kind of wish I could have been in that back club. Bring the camera, get some neat pictures. I think as artists, a lot of us are naturally, inherently a little nocturnal anyway. I like to be up late, that's when a lot of that inspiration strikes. So, the code word, the secret word, for the comments this week is club. In whichever form you would like to present it. Really appreciate. All the little details that we're doing here. I think what we should do though, switch to a larger brush, larger flat, make it a bit brighter. We're desaturating it, re-interject that saturation. Switch over to the fan brush. I pressed fairly hard there initially, harder than I intended to. Do be careful of that. Here, I think we can actually do some subtle draping foliage, but also a much more elongated piece of it that kind of connects up to the top there. It's all coming together. Just takes time. We do still need to add texture to our trees. Let's do that. I'm going to go back to the larger flat. Mix up a warmer brown. Something brighter than what we already have on the trees. But not too much more saturated. 
switch back to this it already is green on it but I'm not too concerned because green on trees is actually a very natural color and I'll just tap this texture on there so here same thing predominantly going to apply this to the sides that have the light not getting too much extra texture or detail but it's that little bit that does help now we'll grab that same pigment head over to the other side of the canvas and just give this the same attention and care that we did the rest of the piece can do a little bit of a drag if you want, but it's not necessary. And then even in the darker areas, I might do a singular little tap. You can also use green and make it look a little mossy here and there if you'd like. Admittedly, I think there might be too much of a duality between how this rises on the left-hand side and how the one rises on the right-hand side. So I'm going to hide this just a little bit behind some foliage in a way that we haven't done before. Grabbing Mars Black, Titanium White, Arthalo Green. Hint of the yellow. We're just working on the darker base layer and I want it to be a bit more green than I want it to be the warmer yellow. So we'll just build up nice dark green. Maybe even go a little bit darker. And using this brush I'm just going to essentially sketch in a bush of some sort that and present itself all the way out here. You know what, maybe I'll make it even higher. Perhaps it's growing along the tree. And this will just be a different element that doesn't exist on the other side of the painting, but it'll have the same colors, so it'll feel like it fits. Lots of revision here, but in a nice exploratory way. And we'll still leave that open area of water. I like that a lot. I keep letting this go and then going back towards building it up higher. I think it's just one of those things that's meant to be and we'll make it so, right? and just let it escalate naturally. Lots of minute markings. I'll make it even darker in the true corner, but I'm going to apply the paint in that same tapped way I did the edges. That way we build that Repetition, pattern, consistency. We can put it towards the back of them, towards the bottom. Covering up the majority of the base of the tree, which was the initial goal here. Maybe it even finds its way wrapping around up here. That's neat. Okay, so now we'll brighten our pigment. We'll make it more of that golden hue. And we'll switch our brush to the liner. 
Make sure that it's nice and damp. And I think this is actually a little bit too cool of a pigment. We definitely need more of our yellow ochre. It's a nice pigment, it just doesn't match aesthetically that which we've built around it, right? And then here, just individually, I'm painting on little leaves. Starting on the edge, because that's where we're getting the most light. It's a tap, but I'm applying a little bit of pressure so that it expands on the canvas and creates a bit of an elongated marking rather than a circular one. And that's just a quick and easy way to render the leaves. And then as our pigment starts to dissipate, we can work our way back into the negative space. Just like so. Establish that texture, even in small part, all the way throughout. This also isn't our final layer of it, so don't feel like you have to overdo it. We are building a work in progress. Perhaps this protrudes to a greater degree. It sticks out more so that this doesn't cover it like it does this area. And now that I'm running out of pigment, I'm going to start to work backwards. Make it a bit more sparse. Still trying to keep it very randomized though. Now we basically just have water on the brush that's a little bit green. And as it dries it will become even more semi-transparent. So, new paint. Up at the top. Have it wrapping around the tree just a little bit. Create that extra instance of depth. Could also definitely paint some wildlife in here. Doesn't have to be bats, despite my affinity for them. When I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I lived by these caves. And this beautiful opening in the roof is a really unique space but you would always find different creatures and whatnot. It really prompted a love for these settings. Love exploring areas like this. Real reverence for nature. Here we're getting brighter. And now along the edges, as we've done before. It'll really show up up here as we have a lot of contrast, that darker water on the opposite side. It's 
definitely creating that variance that I wanted. You have to be careful about not adding too, too much light. Over here, because we are in the corner, we don't want to draw the eye. And keep it here or move it off the canvas. But this definitely does work in this setting. And it makes sense that this would have light. Now, for the first time in a while, we'll take this step back, look at it as a whole, and I think I'm really happy with how it all turned out. I have a couple little additions, which I'll walk you through right here, but it's starting with just a nice bright green on the warmer side, so additional yellow over our phthalo green, and I'll use this in a variety of places, but I'll we'll work it up towards the top of the canvas in the branch that we previously established. I'll we'll work some additional highlights over here, some in this tree as well, but I know this is a painting that I really don't want to end. It's certainly been cathartic. It's been a little bit like therapy in the way that we always want painting to be. And I really hope that you enjoyed it. That it meant something. I hope you can take these ideas and work them into other paintings and that you can find some inspiration, some great. Next week, I think we might paint a rather complicated landscape. One with this great winding road and we'll see. We'll see where we land, but that's definitely where our inspiration is taking me right now. That said, if you haven't, make sure that you do subscribe. That way, you do get to see the painting lesson that comes out next week. And again, if you're new here, like help with the drawing process, or you like the ebooks, the art critiques, the Facebook group, all of that good stuff, it's linked in the description under Patreon. You can get the brushes also in the description, so you can work with exactly what I am. really hope you enjoyed this, though. And I thank you for being here. It's nice that we get to spend this time together. Okay, I know I should put the brush down because I could do this forever. And I want to, but we are calling it <laughs> for this week anyway. I will see you next week with a brand new painting lesson. I thank you for being here. I hope you leave inspired and feeling good. So, 
I'll see you soon. And um, above all, as always, stay creative.